Maybe we should get that. Okay. There's the warning. Hey. Okay. You're a good idea. We should do that. All right. right after this. Uh, and I'm waiting for the link. No, nope. it's a nope, won't let you error zoom. You do not have permission to live stream. Yeah. Well, that's where we well, need to get. Oops. Mm -hmm. Next time I will make the zoom invite myself from my zoom account and we'll see if that is the issue since but, it's not my link. But can and, you, but can you, um, do you yeah. have, can you put more than one, two people on there? Cause you got the time limit or you've got the paid account. Well, you need I'm a paid account. I'm going to have to buy Zoom, but I think, I'm gonna, I think I'm jumping ship on Zoom and I'm going to go with StreamYard, honestly. Oh, no, 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 no. That's that's a, everybody that's a YouTuber uses StreamYard. That's garbage. I've been on a few times. Okay. So we're going to broadcast tomorrow night. <laughs> we'll get the link. Everybody get the, the link. Um, we'll broadcast tomorrow night as if it's happening tonight. All right. That's all we can really do. Right. Or I'll turn right around and when we close it, I'll just immediately upload it. If everybody wants to stick around for another two hours, but yeah, but then uh, everybody has to. No, that's no. fine. No, I think well, that's right. fine. I'll. You guys it, can it, cuss out got... and I can edit out the cuss words. So go uh, ahead. Another cuss thing we can do if it goes tomorrow night is we can all promote it for the whole day and say tonight. Uh, mm -hmm. You know. Uh, Steve, Steve Bassett tells us about seeing the bodies or whatever we want to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Nicole, take it away. All right, here we go. All right. Well, I just gathered all of our usual suspects here tonight so we could talk about the UPT or the UAPTF report that came in, our nine pages that gets whittled down to, I think, six that have actual information on them. I know, Steve, you joined me the other night on Spaced Out Radio. Melinda was supposed to be there. Tom, we all had a great discussion. Victor, Preston, you're the new one on the panel, <laughs> extended from Friday, but it's nice to have you along with us. Sinead, I know this is your first disclosure panel discussion that you've been involved in, but I think our experiencer panel went so well that I just wanted you along for the ride with this one as well. I think we'll have others join us a little later. And I know Preston, you have to sneak off, I think in about 40 minutes now. So if you would like to lead us off on your thoughts with the report coming out and anything you found interesting, why don't you just go ahead and take the floor? Preston Bennett. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Nicole. Yeah, I mean, I've read this report several times hoping that there's something more to it that I'm missing. Uh, I'm disappointed. I, re I really am. And uh, you know, I've talked to some contactees about this, and I do know a person who's well-connected in the military and asked her about it. And she said, yes, there will be more stuff forthcoming. Mm -hmm. uh, she says that the threat narrative is going to be ramped up, and that is going to be used to sort of clamp down on secrecy again. They're going to call this a national security issue and use that as an excuse not to release information. Uh, so I expect that this is really just beginning, this whole battle to get the truth out about what's going on here. Uh, I'm disappointed that this report is dealing only with simple sightings uh, when this is probably the least complicated aspect of the whole UFO phenomena. Many people are having face-to-face -face contact. And uh, the contactees I'm talking to say that the ETs are planning on ramping up their publicity campaign, <laughs> that there will be further major sightings that are very public. Oh, I thought you were talking Facebook. They're going to start doing some more Facebook work. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. We can start a Facebook group. <laughs> we're we're going to get him on one of these panels one of these days. Steve, Steve uh, may have his first UFO sighting, are you saying? Hey, yeah. <laughs> what? You've never seen a UFO? Oh. Hey, he yeah. was asking oh. for it the other night. He said, please take me away or beam me up. Oh, yeah, I'm ready to go anytime, but I, they're, not, they're, not, they're not coming. Well, they will. Wait, wait. Did I understand, Steve, you haven't had a sighting? No. 
<laughs> closest thing uh, I came was oh, at a Laughlin yeah. many, many years ago. It seemed like at the Laughlin conference, the original one. Apparently, oh, they did tend to show up. And I, we went out on the, the, uh, the river area there, river sidewalk, and there was something hanging in the air. It was daytime. It wasn't nighttime. A lot of people were looking at it. And I kind of watched it and watched it. That's the closest they came. And I'm, that's just not, not worthy of being called the true sighting. So, no, yeah. I've never had one. But I don't look up in the sky that much. I, I'm, I'm uh, you know, I just don't. You'll have to go out with Melinda on one of her UFO tours. Yeah. <laughs> there. That's right. She'll show, she'll show you one. Sedona, Steve. <laughs> oh, I'll be I'm there. Sedona, Steve. Steve. I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm going to be there probably in about mm, five weeks, four or five weeks. Yeah, but I'm curious to see how. Call you know, me. Call me before you come so I can block out time to be with you. Okay. I, I'm okay. curious to see how the U.S. government you know, deals with this because uh, I think we've got a lot of ammunition. <laughs> Uh, as UFO researchers to say that this is a real phenomena and their absolute refusal to even use the word extraterrestrial in any meaningful way is so utterly disingenuous. I mean, we know they know, they know, we know they know. Uh, it's, it's going to reach a point where this is go going to become a real hot issue, I think. I think the media is really beginning to latch onto this. And I think that's good news. Mm -hmm. So I feel like this is going to get a lot more publicity. It is going to be taken a lot more seriously. And I don't see it going away. I just don't think our government is going to cooperate. I think they're going to drag their feet the entire way. Yeah, I agree with you there. And I think uh, what I found most interesting that jumps out with me and still has stuck with me was on page three when it, they mentioned probably multiple types. That was just like, okay, they, they know what they're talking about here, even though they're still playing this. We don't know what they are game. You know, just the little snidbits are sneaking through, but yeah. I think I'll yeah. kick it maybe over to Tom or Steve here. And I know we talked about, this is definitely a preliminary report and it is setting up the task force to become a permanent entity with funding, 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 funding. So go ahead, Steve, I'll let you jump in first. And then I would like to hear Tom's thoughts on this too. Is this going to be creating a whole new government entity? Look, uh, what's going on right now is extraordinarily complex. And so it's, Boy, it's, it, I, I don't envy anybody that hasn't been watching the game for a long time. Think of it this way. Imagine that a play is being put on, on a big stage, and then you're in the audience. And there's a certain number of people that know the script. And so they started the play off. And they actually know the script, so they kind of know where it's going to go. And it's going to go. But the way this is uh, being ducted, over time, other people actually go up on stage and become part of the play, but they don't know the script. They're basically trying to kind of figure out what it probably is and get involved in the play and their numbers grow and grow and grow. So it's all it's being, it's on the stage and it is a play, but it's obviously not as cohesive as you would expect. And there are a lot of players here. It's also a charade. Um, in so many ways. Look, the, the preliminary report is just one lie after another, after another. And all this business about, okay, we're going to have another report in 90 days. We need to start looking at this. That's all charades, all nonsense. I am at, the, at this time, just give me an example. Right now, I have a copy of a briefing book that includes in it affidavits from sac base officers to the events that happened back in 63, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8 at the nuclear facility. And I'm trying to push that into the Washington Post, force it in. And think about that. Okay. Essentially, what, I've, what I'm trying to present them, what I've told them about, is that the Air Force has known about craft coming down and turning off our missiles mm -hmm. since 63, which is almost 60, uh, 60 years ago. And, and they, 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 they shut shut people down, they wouldn't let them talk. But those witnesses have come forward, but they can't get traction, they can't get a congressional hearing. 
these are real witnesses. These are real affidavits. And that's just seven affidavits. There's several dozen witnesses behind them. So what's the message I'm giving to the Washington Post? When the ONI says it's time, okay, we need to start looking at this so we can figure it out. It's an outright lie, period. The Navy has known what they are since the 60s, but actually all the way back to the 50s. And so what's happening is that the, the DOD and the services or whatever is has been dragged into this because of the events starting in, uh, in 2017, they kind of know where it's going. They know what they already know, but they can't say what they already know because that would be awkward. And so they're saying what they can say to go along with the process. And it's lie after lie after lie. And as I've said many times, they're li they have to lie their way out from under the big lie. And I'm okay with that because it, it's, it's, it would be easier on everybody if people just accepted that the, the, the emperor was, was clothed uh, with the idea that the emperor doesn't get interrupted. The emperor's going to do some, something nice for us. So far, so good, except that we just had a nasty turn of events. So this charade, this, this play has been going on and going on and making progress. More people have been joining. Admiral Woolsey turned up, not Admiral Woolsey, CIA Director Woolsey turned up on the stage saying, yes, I, I think we need to, this is, we can't explain this. 20 years ago, he told you to go to hell. Mm -hmm. He brought it up and he's actually savaged the issue. Brennan, Norquist, all of this. These are people coming up on the stage. But what's happened? What's happened is, I think it finally, as the, particularly as the report started approaching, going back X number of weeks, some of the diehards over the Department of Defense decided, wait a minute, wait a minute, we can't take this anymore. This is getting, we know, this, we thought this would just blow away, it would go away, but it's not going away. The New York Times, the Washington Post, article after article after article, my God, they're coming for us. Truth embargo is going to happen. And, 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 and that cannot happen. I do not want this truth embargo to end until I am dead. Then you can have all the goddamn truth you want, but not while I'm working here because I am uncomfortable with having to deal with it. Screw them. So but what happened is this, they started to push back. So we finally, it took three years. I mean, for three years, we were seeing no pushback. But as we got close to this situation with the new president and then of course the the, the, the little maneuver by Rubio, which is a purely political maneuver. He didn't give a crap whether we know about the ETs or not. He wants to be president. He'll do anything to be president. The point is, is that they realized, my God, this could happen. And so several things have, have reflected this. One, they went after Lou Elizondo uh, in ways that are not clear, but it was enough that Lou approached the IG over the DOD and basically said, this is not acceptable. Um, my character is being assassinated. I think this may have been internal, kind of going around the DOD. They weren't giving out press releases or anything, but they were, they were attacking him and he knew it. And so he approached him on that. And apparently he didn't like the response that he got from the IG's office. And, and then I think as he is watching things, and he's obviously, he's actually talking to the IG, he's pretty close to the situation. As we know, the DOD gave the IG the authority to kind of pull things together, pull the report together. He's seeing hmm, this isn't quite going the way I wanted. And so he raised that issue. Apparently that heated things up even more. So that Lou actually hired Danny Sheehan to be his attorney. I think you all know this. Now, Danny Sheehan is one of the best known legal activists in the world. In the 20th century, when he was at his peak, he was driving the government nuts. I mean, nuts. He was driving the nuclear industry nuts. He was like the progressive activist just doing all the trouble he all the good trouble he could until finally they destroyed they destroyed Christic Institute and drove him out of town. He had to pay a bunch of money, but fortunately Lawrence Rockefeller paid it for him. And then he went west and created the Romero and he's doing some nice things. But now he's back in the middle of this because Lou brought him in. And Danny has been talking about this. Apparently Lou has greenlighted him to talk in some detail about what the hell's going on. So what I'm about to tell you now, he has said in several public forums and probably would say tonight if he shows up. 30 minutes. They have had meetings in SCIF in Washington, DC with 10, 15, 20 members of the inspector general's office and they are going at it. 
and Danny is going warrior mode. Right. He's going, he's going public and he is saying, we've got to bring them down. We've got to have a mass uh, public movement. We can no longer leave it to them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so we know that, that there is definitely a uh, mixed martial arts cage match going on over at the Pentagon. Okay, fine. I noticed that. I was hoping it wouldn't be a distra distraction. But then, of course, the, 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 the preliminary assessment came out. Mm -hmm. And I realized, okay, well, this is asinine. This is ridiculous. It's an insult to our intelligence. It's a joke. There's things in there that are so laughable. Uh, I think it must have been written by a couple of corpsmen. They brought in and said, yeah, 24 hours. Knock something out. we got to get it out on the 25th. And people will be upset with this. It's a catastrophe. It's ridiculous. But hey, when it comes to the DOD and the Air Force and so forth, they have done a lot of ridiculous things. So that kind of irritated. But what really got me out of my usually humorous demeanor is the response of Warner and Rubio. Have you, I think you all have seen the responses of Warner and Rubio. If you haven't, I'll be happy to send you the links. They yep. are beyond disgraceful. It is awful. They're basically, what they were saying is, well, it wasn't, well, I think, uh, I think uh, Warner said, well, it seemed insufficient. But he said, well, this is the beginning. We can go from here and we can start trying to learn about what this phenomenon is. That is a lie. Warner knows exactly what it is. Rubio may or may not, he doesn't care. Warner has been around a long time and as head of Intel committee, I assure you he's been informed. So now the lies are piling up on top of the lies and they're expecting us to believe this. So if I can get inside the Washington Post with those affidavits on the fact that, 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 that the Air Force knew these craft are coming down and hanging over the nuclear sites and turning off the missiles, some of the editors may go, wait a minute. Well, if they kind of knew that in the 60s, what's all this about? We need to try to find out what it is. So what you're seeing is Warner and Rubio may have been forced to back off. There has been months when they had plenty of opportunity to talk to some people over at the DOD who probably gave them a number of reasons why, well, look, you know, Marco, Mark, I like to call them the Marks brothers. Uh, there's so much going on now. So many threats in the world, the Chinese, the Soviets, what, I mean, the Russians, whatever. Let, let's slow this down. There's no hurry. We can get around to this in five, 10 years or so. You know, kind of chill, all right? And we'll be more cooperative with you. I know you want a lot from us and everything else. You're the Intel Committee. We'll help you out. You need a vacation in the Caribbean? We can work that out too, whatever. I'm worried that that has happened, okay? Because what they put out is an absolute disgrace to Warner and Rubio. It's a disgrace to the Senate Intel Committee and it's a disgrace to the Congress as a whole. And it is incredibly difficult to, I mean, the Senate as a whole, it's incredibly difficult to disgrace or embarrass presently the Senate as a whole. And so I got really upset and put out a warrior type post. Then I took a Xanax and I chilled because I realized, wait a minute, Steve. Yeah, you don't want to go to war just yet. And you need to see what's going to happen because I think some other members of Congress are going to look at that shit and go, oh, are you kidding me? Andre Dar Car Carson has already called for hearings and he's probably going, wait a minute, wait, 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 we're going to wait 90 days for, a, for the actual report to come? And so there's a lot that can happen here. But let me tell you something. The top media, like the New York Times and the Washington Post, are filled with a lot of very smart people, very smart people. And they are starting to sh see this charade for what it is. And they don't like being dragged down, uh, I say, taken down a path of nonsense and charades and having to write articles about it. Most of the articles that have been written about this by the Times and the Washington Post are basically writing about outright lies. They are literally giving the world an account of the charade as it goes on without happening to mention that it's a charade. Now that's not the way journalism is supposed to happen. And I can assure you, as they start to figure this out, they're gonna realize, wait just a minute here. And so while I seem a little worked up right now, inside I feel a certain calm. I think the DOD has gone too far. The ONI has stepped on its own, you know, what do you, never mind. And, uh, and uh, uh, Marco Rubio and Mark Warner got a little bit too confident 
that all that great press, particularly Rubio, they were getting because they put that report thing in there may not be enough if they decide to back off of this thing. I think they're going to get a load of shit on this. But that's where things are at. That's how complicated it is. I'm watching it as close as I can, but I am starting to make direct attempts to force information into the major papers that shows what the ONI is saying and the DOD is saying and this preliminary assessment piece of crap is saying is absolutely a lie from beginning to end. Okay. Tom, jump in. You're in yes. the Washington area too as well, right? Yes, sir. Well, uh, I think if, if they have another report in 90 days and even if it goes to the Senate, and there may or may not be something that goes public with that that's unclassified. But if that happens, I see that as pretty big, good because that's another opportunity uh, for the press to cover something. And if they don't uh, keep submitting things to the Senate and to the Congress, then the press can basically drop the story unless something else comes up. So. I, I'm I'm hopeful that with this 90 days scenario that uh, there's going to be further press coverage of this whole topic, and that will be good. Another thing that I'm feeling positive about is the this uh, classified report that went to the Senate and to the con congressional committees. Uh, that's an opportunity to be leaked, and the uh, congressional committees are notorious for leaking like a sieve. And I'm holding out hope that maybe we could, we'll get to see a copy of that, or at least parts of it. I think that's good. Also, I went through this memorandum that the Deputy, Deputy Secretary of Defense wrote, and uh, I'm, I'm encouraged by that. Um, now, the, the focus on that is on the DOD training ranges and installations. Okay, installations is broad. So... That really means anything, uh, any Defense Department installation. That's good. And uh, they're nominally focused on maintaining operation security and safety. But the, the interesting thing is the Deputy Secretary of Defense has specifically assigned to the Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security to develop a plan to implement this UAP, uh, this UAP monitoring, you know, synchronizing collection, reporting, and analysis, uh, securing the training ranges, uh, you know, organization, uh, getting necessary authorities to do the work, uh, providing a timeline, and coordinating with all the the principal players, you know, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the secretaries of the military departments. And they're specifying in the memo that they want any UAP observations to be reported within two weeks. You know, that's pretty good. So I, I guess my remaining question is, will the public ever get to see the, any of this information? You know, I'm not optimistic about that, but from the documentation that I'm seeing, it appears that there's gonna be an attempt to carry out this monitoring of any future UAP activity, and there, there appears to be an opportunity for further press coverage, and maybe there's an opportunity for leakage. So I'm, I'm a little bit more optimistic now. Tom, but can I just ask you this? The United, what does it say that the United States military and the various you know, the entities that do high, high, high grade surveillance have been monitoring UFO, UAP activity for 70 years. And then they say, what we need to do is we need to start organizing so we can monitor it. Do you see the problem here? The very fact that they're, they're, they're just doing it. They're basically saying, look, let's start all over again. Let's pretend nothing has ever happened in the past. There's a, there's a statement in, the, in this report that says due to the lack of historical data from the Air Force, we can't, in, in, in that assessment, they, they completely forgot that there was a project, project Blue Book for 15 yeah. years that studied thousands of sightings. Steve, that I idiot writes well, that and forgets okay, about it. Okay, but there, there's a difference. I mean, I agree with you, Steve, and we all, 
as UFO people, we know UFO history well enough that mm -hmm. this doesn't align with what we know. However, the DOD and the Congress and maybe even the president are going public with this subject. That's the difference. And like you've said, you know, there's a script and this is kind of like a kabuki theater. They have to lay the foundation uh, for this uh, to be discussed publicly. And that's what I think is going on. Now, it's, it's just like a first baby step. They're not anywhere near where we know they should be. But uh, I, I think that it is moving in the right direction. I, I, I agree. And, I, and we were moving in the right direction. It was slow because of the political and the pandemic and everything else. And so it was easy to accept the slowness. But now that's all disappearing and moving into the past. Right. And so... Um, here, let me jump in real quick, not to yeah. cut you off, Steve, but Melinda, this is actually something you and I talked about quite a bit the other night. So if you want to unmute yourself and let's talk. Um, well, I, I think how we put it, Melinda, was the reversal of the Condon report. So unmute yourself and jump in this conversation. She's coming. She's coming. What was that? <laughs> I, said, this segues, what was that? I said what Steve is talking about segues into the conversation we had the other night about this being a reversal of the Condon report. So I wanted you to jump in and give uh, us Condon, Robertson and everything. But I, I, I have no doubt that anyone here would agree with me. You know, it's so funny. Um, it, going back to I'll finish what I was just saying, though. Um, yeah, I think this is a 180 on the government's position on UFOs in the past. Um, but at first, I was very hopeful. I thought, I thought what came out matched exactly what Jim Semivan told me was going to be in it. And uh, whoops, I need to turn off what's something I've got going on in the background that's distracting me. Sorry. Uh, and uh, um, and I thought it matched, you know, what he had said. So I was very hopeful. I thought there was a little more in there than I expected. I was uh, very disappointed. It was only the six pages, you know, um, and uh, or nine pages. And uh, and so I, I was very disappointed, of course, that there wasn't more and there wasn't specific case information, et cetera. But right away, I thought, OK, it's exactly what Jim said it would be. So I kind of knew what to expect. Secondly, it had, uh, as you and I discussed, Nicole, I thought it did a 180. Can you guys hear me OK? My yeah, computer yeah. looks like it's freezing no. up. Keep going. Keep going. Uh, OK, very good. It's just on, on my end, the image is freezing up. Um, and and so I thought, yeah, it's a reversal of the government's position for 70 years. And uh, so so that's what her and I were talking about. I yeah, I thought it was a, a 180, a, a definite sea change in the government's position. And I think but now as days have gone by, see, I was very <laughs> favorable at first, and now as days have come, gone by, I've become more negative, um, only in that um, I agree, for instance, today, Bob Salas uh, wrote something very interesting on Facebook, where he stated all the obvious lack of historical, yeah, I see Steve nodding there, lack of historic um, information and and it falling short in so many areas. Uh, and I agreed with everything he stated very much. And so I ended up then going, OK, is it what I expected? Yes. Am I disappointed it wasn't more? Yes. But at the same time, I'm a little conflicted because when I'm disappointed, I do feel it's a 180 on the government's position. And the fact that this came from the head of the intelligence community um, and, you know, from, from uh, the DNI office. And so, therefore, the head of intelligence, thus, that, you know, saying that. Uh, you know, UFOs are real. Um, they're serious. They're very important. They require a much larger investigation and et cetera. So all I can say is yes to all that and, and realizing this is the beginning of a long process. Uh, Jim has told me all along this would be the beginning of a long process. I think we're all clear on that. And so I'm conflicted. 
on one hand, I'm disappointed that there wasn't more in it, obviously, but I'm hopeful that this has not only created a 180 sea change, as I said, in the government's view and stated so officially, um, and as well as clearly the report states that there should be a bigger investigation and that there will be more. Now we have the announcement that I, I guess it's 90 days from now is the congressional briefing and we'll see you know, what goes with that. So I think we're all just waiting once again. Let me uh, stop you right there, Melinda. I wanna sneak this question into Preston before he has to leave. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, I forgot about that. So real quickly, I know uh, a lot of us have kind of talked about the juicy elements of this being in the appendix part. And I was even glancing down at the last bullet point in, in appendix B, number eight. It says, there will be recommendations regarding increased collection of data, enhanced research and development, additional funding and other resources. Preston, do you think this is a little in for them to start coming to the UFO community and maybe seeking resources from those in the field that have been following this diligently for decades now? What yeah. are your thoughts on the <laughs> appendix? Yeah, I, I highly doubt it. I don't think they're going <laughs> to be come to, coming to us because they already have way, way more evidence. I agree with what Steve is saying, this is lie upon lie upon lie. It, they, when I heard that there's no evidence that these are extraterrestrials, I mean, that made me laugh out loud. These are obviously metallic craft that are moving way beyond our own most advanced craft. They know, they've known for decades what this is. They already have the evidence. Saying that they're starting an investigation is ridiculous. We all know how much money and time and effort they've poured into this. <laughs> this is where a lot of our black budget is going. We know this. It's so completely disingenuous that I have lost complete trust in them. I was really <laughs> hoping that they would release some real good footage. Show us a piece of metal. What happened to that quote? You know, we have material from otherworldly vehicles. Mm -hmm. Show us that. <laughs> they are backpedaling and lying, lying, lying. I, agree with all of you that this is very tightly controlled. My hope is that there's internal conflicts within this organization that's covering this up and that there are people within there who really want this information out. Mm -hmm. And I do think that it's probably going to move a bit faster than we expect because of the pressure coming from the ETs. Uh, the ETs are real. This is a real phenomenon. They are, are watching all of this very closely. This is the information I'm getting from contactees. And uh, if our government does not move more quickly with this, they will. They have the power to disclose tonight. <laughs> they could do that. And I think that's why we're probably gonna see a little bit more action. I'm not sure, um, as Melinda says, is this a 180 degree turnaround? Mm, not quite, I don't think, because they are not, flat out saying this is extraterrestrial, uh, but I think what they are gonna say is a complete 180 degrees that this is a national security threat. Connick Committee, Blue Book, um, Robertson Panel all said there's nothing to this. It's not a national security threat. Uh, that's we, what I meant. Yeah. Yeah, that's what um, I so, meant. Yeah, but uh, so I think, yeah, they are going to say it's a national security threat, but they're not saying really that there is something to this. They're saying, eh, me. it's a lot of mealy mouthed hand wringing is what I call it. Uh, so I am very eager to see how they try to handle this when there's a major UFO event. Uh, Cause the evidence is coming one way or another. If, and I don't think it's gonna be from them. Yeah, politics as usual continues to be theater, right? Um, so it's, it's more of the same in some ways, but still disappointing. And actually, Victor, would you like to speak to any of the points that anybody's made so far? So anything you'd like to jump off of here? Oh, well, it's, it's almost like trying to comment on 15 things at once. It's, it's, it's difficult yes. to do that. Uh, um, yeah, I, it, the, the points that everybody's making, and it's quite clear that uh, what we've been handed is a, it's a dead fish on a plate. Okay, so let's just admit that to begin with. <laughs> I like that. It is. 
Um, I think we have to admit a few things or just look at a few things is um, uh, we have been looking for this kind of acknowledgement, you know, for 60 years. Um, and now we've got it. It's been put in our lap, dead fish or not. Okay. Uh, it is a form of acknowledgement. I think we have to accept that. And in that sense, it's a, it's a big deal. But how do you accept, as Steve is saying, other people are saying, how do you accept lies that are being put in your plate? And the other metaphor that I would use is uh, for so long, we've been pushing this disclosure car up a hill, you know, a very, very steep hill. We're all behind it pushing like hell. Um, and now we're over the top of that hill. We, we've got some sort of acknowledgement. And now we're starting to push the car downhill, but there's a problem. Uh, the people inside the car got the brakes on. And we are gonna to have to do something to get them to take their bloody feet off the pedal, off the brakes. And what, what I would advance is the idea that Steve is, is, uh, is sort of harping on is that we have to raise this nuclear issue and re-manipulate the press, re-manipulate the press to come to the understanding that this stuff has been going on since the 1960s with the nuclear shutdown tampering issue. That to me, and I've had enough conversation with Bob Salas, I, you know, Bob and I talk a lot about this. That is the key issue. Why would China send over craft to shut down our missiles? Why would Russia send over craft to shut down? That just is not, that's just absolute ridiculous rhetoric. The fact of the matter is, off-world civilizations are coming here, sending us a message uh, that we've got with the affidavits from Patrick McDowell, uh, Dwayne Arneson, uh, Bruce Fenstermacher, uh, Charles Holt, uh, Robert Jameson, Jerome Nelson, and Robert Salas, okay? Once they get those seven documents in their hands, and I plan to do this up here with the Toronto Star and with CTV News and CBC News, okay? So I'm going to be working in concert with some other people that want to do that. We've got to get that, those documents in front of the press. And instead of the press reporting in favor of all of the crap that's on that plate right now, this, it, it, Steve's right, they're reporting on lies. We've got, the, we've got an opportunity to allow the press to now report on something that's factual. So they will report, instead of reporting uh, for, the, for the government, for the DOD, they will begin reporting against all of those lies. And those affidavits will be the beginning of how the press will be able to react to the lies. So to me, that's a very pivotal point that I think we've got to um, somehow generate the Washington Post, uh, New York Times, whoever else was in charge of that kind of thing with those editors and get them on top of We're witnessing a new set of Pentagon papers here, okay? And that's what's gonna to have to happen. These documents will become a new set of Pentagon papers and the Pentagon's gonna to have to deal with it because nobody can tell me or anybody else that I know that the Pentagon doesn't know about the tampering. They've known about it for, for 60 years. Okay? They, yes. Yeah, of course they do. <laughs> they, they, yeah. They've known about it. I mean, it's, it's been there. So all we have to do is get those papers out in front of them. That's why I'm calling them the new Pentagon papers, because that will be the, the key that will turn the car on, have the brakes, uh, you know, uh, have the feet taken off the brakes, and there's going to be a sail down, down the hill to some better form of what's going on right now. So that's what I'll say right there at this point. Some quick points here. One, from the beginning, for, for a very long time, the nuclear tampering witnesses are the witnesses of all of them. Uh, no, no disrespect to David Fravor, the nuclear witnesses are in another place altogether, which is why the, the, the DOD literally has never acknowledged them at all. Nothing. They don't exist. And, and somehow they were able to convince the major papers like the New York Times and the Washington Post to not acknowledge them. They gave a press conference right here in the press club, and there were a bunch of press there, and there was no follow-up. And the Washington uh, Metro reporter, Metro editor came in, wrote a funny column about the cookies. These are sack base officers. And so because these nuclear witnesses who have been alluded to by Elizondo, right, they have been alluded to, they've not been excluded. I think some of them might have been in one of the identified shows. They are the biggest threat to the truth embargo. 
And so that's point number one. Point number, so, you know, the DOD is scared of that, but there's really not much they can do about it. But unfortunately, we have the records and I'm already on it. Trust me. Okay. Now, the second point is this. You want to talk about this 180. Not quite. Back then, they said, you're seeing something else. It, you know, it's, it's a balloon, it's this, it's swamp gas, whatever. You're just seeing something else. And so what you're seeing is not even what you think it is. Uh, but whatever it is, it's not a threat. That was their general position, okay? Here is what they, where they have come to now. Yes, you're seeing something real. And whatever it is, we don't know, but it could be a threat. That's not a 180. That's just more game playing, all right? And by the way, the whole, this, I, I'm a big thing on language when it comes to things like this and, and activism. The phrase, are UFOs real, or always, is one of the dumbest non sequiturs of the entire 20th century. It is utterly absurd. You're seeing something, yes, but is it real? Well, of course it's real. I can see the damn thing, right? And so what UF, are UFOs real came to mean in the truth embargo is, is what you're seeing extraterrestrial? But they couldn't say that. Basically saying, is what you're seeing real? What? Okay, so I'm but gonna jump in there, Steve, because please. that is such an interesting question. And Bob is here, he hasn't spoken yet. So Bob, I'm gonna kick that to you and your overalls. I've given your overalls some props in the chat, but that's private and overalls should be publicly admired. So I just wanted to publicly admire. <laughs> a dying, a dying style. But, 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 please, uh, you know, if there's anything you want to speak to at all that anyone said. I just well, I'll, 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 I live in Alabama, so, so, and I work outside a lot. So I got to wear overalls because I'm in Alabama. Okay. So uh, Steve is a terrifically powerful advocate for his, his position. And I want to support his statements that what is needed is very well informed, knowledgeable people need to put the evidence they have, so long as it's supported with some documentation in front of every Congress critter involved on these committees and every major newspaper that might pick it up and run with it. Now, if they're just, just, just uh, want to also point out that um, the reason I was late is I was absolutely consumed yeah. by uh, by Corbell and Knapp on TMZ showing new videos that, because I had been told by my usual friends that Corbell has been cut off. And so I wondered if this video was going to be new and it come from an official leak inside the Pentagon. Knapp made it clear it did not. So multiple people that were on those ships in 2019 took out their cameras, videos, et cetera, video cameras, cell phones, whatever, made their own videos, and they have some of them. Now, the problem with this, of course, is we're trusting. We're mm -hmm. trusting. We don't know the providence. We don't have a government guarantee behind it to whatever, whatever that means. So it's going to be a little bit problematic, except these things look really interesting. And so I've got it on DVR and I can go back later. Sorry, I was late. Okay. So, um, but I, given, given that I've been in and around government for a long time, uh, I want to say that I've heard senators from a senator from New Mexico, a senator from uh, mm -hmm. uh, elsewhere, congressman from Texas. We're talking about the thing that was interesting to me is in the last few days, right-wing uh, Trump-loving Republicans and left-wing progressive caucus Democrats are all speaking the same language, which is, sure. we don't like this stuff. We're not, we don't like what we're seeing. We have all seen more than this, and we want to mow no more now. So I think what is needed is to try to push these Congress critters into having hearings. So, and you want to you want to get with their staffers, and prime them with questions. So the staffers have time to put it together. 
so that the Congress critter is is completely prepared to do the acting job that the staffers prepare them for in terms of these uh, congressional hearings, because that's really what we need is congressional hearings, because these these witnesses, uh, unless they poke someone out who's not very high level and doesn't have much knowledge, are going to find themselves in the hot seat. And I just think we need to prepare them. Uh, and if it gets way too hot and turns into a real uh, you know, nuclear explosion, the Pentagon's going to retrench. They're going to go in, they're going to hide, they're going to close the door and just stop speaking. So there's a tightrope that has to be walked. Pressure that helps them speak, get more data out, hope other witnesses from these ships come out. So on the TMZ thing tonight, Lieutenant Graves was on, and he said that they were involved in several near misses off the Virginia coast with these, these uh, cubes, these metal looking cubes inside these spherical shells where the medical, the, where the cubicle uh, edges were touching the shells and they had many near misses. And he thought it was, uh, he, and that was the reason he got up on his high horse and demanded that the commander report these incidents to the Navy, to the Navy. And he is there telling the same story again. Uh, then he's, the thing I like about Graves is he's extremely consistent. He never embellishes, never adds to it. He tells the same story over and over. And, and he's ta now talking about all during the time of the maneuvers from off the coast of Virginia to the Teddy Roosevelt training mission that went on down by Florida. Uh, they saw them every single day, sometimes in the hundreds and they were up for hours and they suspended themselves at an altitude nearly immobile over the flat the, the 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 carrier group that's expending an amount of energy that we don't have no idea how to produce in a vehicle without refueling and no refueling was seen so these are just major things that just kind of need to be come out so if you want to help reporters and congress staffers ask the right questions inform them of what some of these already in the public witnesses are saying so that the right questions can be asked. I mean, we can, we can jump up and down the stomp, but we can also help a good outcome happen if we're given the right opportunity by so agree helping prepare them for the right questions. So agree with you there, Bob, so agree with you. And uh, there was something Grant wanted to jump in and, and ask or say, Grant, go for it. Well, I just wanted to point out, um, which I pointed out on the last um, panel, is I think everybody still has this thing backwards. The idea that everybody has sort of bought into is that the Department of Defense suddenly decided to make a disclosure on UFOs and then they pulled it back and lied to us. They had no intention of doing any sort of disclosure, any sort of report. The only reason they did was because on, on October the 4th, 2017, Lou Elizondo resigned in the morning and he and others helped put off Jim Semivan, Chris Mellon, uh, Justice, brought in the New York Times and sat down with the New York Times for three or four hours, showed them videos, gave them documents. Leslie Kane said they basically spelled this out for us. And then it went back to uh, Tom DeLong's organization. And Melinda Leslie was having interviews three years ago. They're on my YouTube where Jim said, we're going to put pressure on Congress. We're going to go in there and we're going to do briefings. And you can even see the latest uh, statements by uh, Bill Nelson, the former uh, senator, who's the head of NASA, who's now talking about NASA um, investigating UFOs, said that he was still in Congress when he heard the pilots. And he said, the pilots are telling the truth. I talked to them. He was in the original briefings, and this is years ago. So what the situation is, is that they put tremendous pressure on Congress. Congress wrote it into the COVID bill, and that's what forced the Defense Department to do this report. They didn't want to do the report. So of course they're going to stall, and they're going to drag their feet, and they're going to do whatever. The one thing I wanted to sort of point out is that I've seen as I watch this is that um, there seems to be a couple other things. And I mentioned this on Twitter that um, yesterday morning in my email box was my reply from the uh, uh, Freedom of Information Act request I made the day that ATIP broke. 
I actually got the famous reporter from New Hampshire, his name is escaping me, who asked Hillary Clinton, Hillary Clinton the question. I went to him and I said, file an FOA right away. It's first come, first serve. Get in there. Ask a question about ATIP. So he filed an FOA. I filed an FOA. I finally got my reply. The reply is dated the day before the report came out on the 24th. And then I saw on Twitter, and I haven't really checked how many there are, but somebody else got a reply. Almost like somebody has greased the skid. Somebody has said, get these FOIs. Because these, these things were stalled for three or four years. And suddenly, every, the same day, everybody starts getting these F FOIAs. The other thing is I say that we had, um, Nicole and I, we had a discussion in Jim and... Um, um, uh, James, Jim, James Fox was on and James Fox said that he had I asked him about Podesta and he said he had talked to Podesta and that Podesta was active and he was going to talk to um, Biden about putting a UFO investigation inside the Office of Science and Technology Policy, which is where the Rockefeller Initiative documents came from. And they're the people that give that, that have instructions for NASA, because what happened in, in the Carter administration was Jimmy Carter sent his, his uh, <clears throat> science advisor press to NASA to do an, an investigation on UFOs and NASA's budget had been cut. So they came back and said, we can't, we, there's no way we don't have any money to do another blue book. They just, and the CIA sent this letter and said, don't dare get involved in UFOs again. And then what happened was they said, they made this little sign off and they said, well, if you've got some metal, we'll, in, we'll investigate the metal, we'll analyze the metal, but we don't have any money to do a UFO sighting. So I know that, that there may have been an initiative where uh, Biden, uh, gives a nod to um, Bill Nelson at NASA to, to make this move. And that's what I think is the most important thing is what's happening behind the scene. Because suddenly you had these FOIAs released, you had uh, NASA starting to talk. And the story is, so I filed an FOIA today uh, with the Office of Science and Technology Policy to see what they've got on UFOs and what kind of conversations they've had with NASA. But the thing, the bottom line is that people have to realize the Defense Department the last thing they want to do, they're forced to do this report. So the, the pressure has got to be put not on them because they're always going to stall their feet. The pressure is to be put on the congressman to keep the pressure on because that's why they're doing the report because the congressman told them to do the report. I want to add one thing that, on Grant to follow up on Grant and to enhance something. Uh, one of the things that I am told, having been doing space stuff for a long, long time, is almost every person that's ever been in orbit has seen something. And I want to remind people that Bill Nelson flew on the shuttle for over a week in the 1980s. I believe he saw something and it changed his life. And because he is the first NASA administrator ever to cross over the Space Act boundary where Department of Defense and CIA can veto whatever they're doing and say, we're going investigating UAPs. He's the first, and I think he has Biden's ear. <clears throat> Boy, there's so much here. Grant, you're uh, muted. And I, I don't know where to begin. Uh, first of all, Podesta pulled his punch. Uh, just make a general rule. Put this out there, folks. Anybody says anything about investigating anything, dismiss it. Okay, just dismiss it. It's, it, we, we don't need more investigation. They've been investigating relentlessly for 75 years. We need disclosure. And in a get disclosure, we need hearings. But investigating and saying we should investigate is a way to engage the issue without offending somebody. So I don't know why he pulled his punch, but the last thing they need is an investigating entity within the, what? The government well, least, spending well, billion. What? Well, let me let me defend him at least to say that at least it's going to the Office of Science Technology Policy, where we're going to get some investigation as to the science and technology behind it, rather than going to the Armed Services and Intelligence Committee, because you're talking about Carson with this we calling for for hearings. If you read his Twitter, he's calling for hearings on the threat that we got to look at the threat behind. This is a national security threat that if they go to Congress briefings and he's in charge. I mean, basically, they're going to be talking about the threat. They're not going to be talking about ETs. They're going to be talking about, let's get some arms, let's get some money. And that's the part that disturbs me. So I at least agree, because Biden can't touch this. Bill Clinton said that before. He said, it's the it's the tar oh. baby. The president can't touch it. So indirectly, they give the nod to this guy. They give the nod there, and they make things happen without. That's why the FOIs, like who give the thing with, suddenly all these FOIs are being answered. Uh, look, uh, hang on, I'm. I'm
You're lost in space. Um, That's okay. Look, I, I would like to bring up. Wait, I'm not going to turn this on. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm practically climbing out of my skin here. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. No, Go ahead. Here, I'll 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 pose it this way. Um, the Twitterverse has been alive, and I've even questioned this a few times over the last month or so. We all know Lou Elizondo was quoted as saying, "You know, we're taking this into second gear." Yeah. And after some time passed, I started to wonder, wh where's third gear? What is third gear going to be? Well, the Twitter versus Alive, Lou is being quoted as saying, it's time to shift it into third gear now. So what does shifting it into yeah. third gear mean to all of you? We can just kind of do a round robin. Let's start with Victor. You've been quiet longest. <laughs> That's one of my fortes, yeah. Um, <laughs> Somebody's printing stuff upstairs. Uh, He's a polite Canadian. Yeah, get off yeah, his back. Yeah. Well, don't get me going. Okay. I uh, see how polite I am. So, third, th what does third gear mean? Uh, well, to me, it, it third gear means uh, re-engaging and, as, as I said earlier, re-manipulating the press, because once the press gets a hold of this and in the right way, if we can put put this forward to the right journalists, and uh, it's something that I've wanted to do for for so many years. And it's happening now, it, it, but they're not talking the same message or the right message. So the third gear to me would be the, the, the media being re-manipulated by people like us, well-informed individuals uh -oh. who are doing the bidding of, of publishers and, and, and editors. So we have to re-inform, re-educate some of these journalists, some of the key mm -hmm. journalists on the bigger newspapers and even uh, you know cable news and all of that. We have to re-educate these people. And the only way to do that is provide them solid information. So I think that's probably, in my mind, what third gear might look like. And then once that's gone, once that's done, then we're, we're not just in third gear. We're going to be in overdrive with, with, the, with the journalists saying, how long has this been going on and why don't we know about it? Why all the lies? What's going on here? And now you've got a different set of, pe of Pentagon papers moving forward to eliminate the obfuscation of the government because they've done it for too long. And the only way out of this folks, I'm, I'm sorry to say it, you know, uh, the, the media in some ways that our best friend in so, some ways, it could be our worst enemy, but we have to co opt these people into understanding that they have a role to play in this and they have to discover the truth in the right way from people like us that will inform and educate them. So that to me, that's the third gear. Wonderful. Thank you, Victor. Tom, I'm going to call on you now. What's what's your perspective on our third gear? I think the third gear could be Luis Elizondo spilling more of the beans. And that it's interesting because Lou has gone on each and every media program imaginable. He has been everywhere. Yeah. And uh, certain narrow-minded people have criticized him for that. But that's it should be actually the opposite. I think it's a very smart thing to do because Lou has been very explicit that he, he's extremely careful not to step into classified information territory. But even if he did, maybe if he said a thing or two that, that technically is, is a, a violation, he's so public at this point that it's going to be difficult, I think, for the DOD to go after him, for the Justice Department. They are going after him, Tom. Well, but that, they're that kind of behind the scenes. Uh, I'm talking about being prosecuted for disclosing classified information. Well, at first it starts behind the scenes with, with the lawyers, and then it moves out. And it's not about classified material. They're pressing him on the NDA. Lou was getting frustrated, and he kept pushing it. You could see he was pushing it further and further and further. And finally, they struck back. And so... They're saying he, uh, he violated some NDAs and they erased all of his files, or they said they erased his entire email files. Danny thinks, no, they just sort of made them go somewhere else. This is getting serious, folks. This is getting serious. So, so uh, and I'll, I'll step back. Well, I'm, my point is that because he has gone so public, that provides cover for him. Right. And uh, it's like, you know, it's like the old saying, they don't want to prosecute you because that that would they would be implicitly admitting that that person had something 
uh, ha had important information. So that's that's what I think could be third gear. And Danny is uh, Danny's coming on with us. He'll be able to address this directly. So Nicole, make a note. Let's ask Danny this when he comes on, sure. um, because I know he's encouraging Lou to talk. At least that's what Dan's told me repeatedly. Right. Dan Sheen's told me repeatedly he's encouraging Lou to say more. So um, I know that he's, you know, advising him on so this very thing. Thoughts, so, Melinda? What, what? What's, your, what's your thoughts on third gear? What do you think third gear is? Oh, gosh. Sorry, guys. Um, well, you know, coming from uh, from Lou, um, I think it followed up in what he said. I'd have to refer to his text um, about uh, uh, about all of us getting involved. I think it was to uh, encourage. That's that's it. I think he was encouraging everyone in the community to get involved and um, to. Uh, I don't know what all he meant by that. Again, I'd have to look at his out his text and the, the later part of it to to know exactly what he said. But I'm my the feeling I got when I originally saw it earlier today was that he was encouraging the community to to get involved, to take action, to do like Victor saying to contact the media, and uh, I think he meant that. And I also think he meant uh, contacting your elected officials, etc. So I think that's what he meant. I'll bring it up right now. You know, um, the big push a few months ago was the the dot com UAPTF Act. Now it was the website going around where you could sign up, and they had all your state representatives kind of loaded in, and you could send them um, this email talking about your concern for the upcoming report. And I only had one of my two state representatives answer me back, which I was impressed I got one, but it was so generic that I couldn't take it seriously at all. So I wrote another letter back <laughs> in return and I haven't received a reply back. So I think the more we do things like that, the more they will have to take you know, individuals seriously that you know, we will keep bugging them until we get non-generic answers to this. So let me Bob make McGuire, a or oh, go ahead, Grant. Um, third gear is, again, goes back to what I said. This is all planned. I was told in 2016, high level officials are going to come forward. They are going to say UFOs exist and they are going to force disclosure. It was called the big man, which was Jim Semivan. I was told Jim Semivan was the guy that was behind dropping it to the New York Times. So they dropped it to the New York Times, Washington Post, and Politico on the same day. That wasn't accident. The meeting with Leslie Kane was not accident. The uh, association with Tom DeLong was not accident. Melinda talked about this. We Three years ago, Jim was saying, this is what we're doing. We're, we're making this move. We're going to put pressure on Congress, and we're going to get Congress to... Uh, to write, write a bill and stuff that happened. That's when, and so when Lou Elizondo left, I was on Dave's show, when as soon as Lou Elizondo left and him and Justice uh, and Mellon, I said, did that uh, Senate thing get signed? And they went, yeah, it's just about signed. And it's like, well, yeah. And that's when he said, I'm going into second gear. And he said, we've got a plan and third gear. Now what the third gear is, I'm not sure, but they're dropping more videos. And the whole deal is you got to look at if Semi Van was behind this whole thing. Semi Van's been in the game forever. He knows exactly how to do this. He told Melinda. In fact, Melinda, you can say that he said, okay, this report's going to come out. And then eventually the third rail is going to come up, the abduction and all this kind of stuff is going to be discussed. I think they have this right down exactly how it's going to done. Semi Van may have done this a number of times, gone for money for certain programs or whatever. They know exactly how to manipulate Congress and how to make the move, how to do it. And he told, almost like telling Melinda, calm down. This is all going to, this report's going to come out. He's predicted everything all the way down. There's nothing random happening here. And the, uh, the, the, the defense department is fighting back, but this is a game that I, I, I don't think they're going to win because um, I believe that um, the, even that Bob is talking about these videos being leaked again tonight. You just keep leak, leaking videos. You just keep this, the, the fire going. And eventually the, the house will, all the, the cards will, collapse <clears throat> okay bob you're up i'm gonna so, switch so, it up uh, on you though like no no it's okay that's okay i i believe that lou is about ready to do some more planned disclosure 
with the under the advice of uh, Danny. Mm -hmm. And because look, look, Danny is the one that claims he advised, you know, Greer and others uh, to uh, do some disclosure that was strategic that would block and and then at the same time inform the uh, security people in a written uh, notarized letter that they were doing this and what the consequences would be if any action was taken. And so there's been no action taken. I think Sheehan has a plan for Lou to let more stuff out, but I'm sure, like Grant says, it's being coordinated with Simi Van and others. I just feel that very strongly. I, I look, this is, is, as Steve has already said, this is clearly all orchestrated. This, and and it, within, day, look, within days, multiple things happen. All the statements are same. And we are, we are we blind, deaf, and dumb? Four weeks before the report came out, every single person that spoke publicly said exactly the same words. From a president of the United States down to DCI, directors of central intelligence, former directors of national, national intelligence, et cetera, they all said, down to Lou Elizondo, they said the same words. It's one of these things. We don't know which one it is. We don't know where it comes from. It's not ours. It's not, we, 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 we have to think it might be an adversary. But if, and I keep saying, if the adversaries had this, we'd already be done. They would already have overthrown us. Okay, so it's just, it's all planned. It's just a, a script. And what our, I want to support Steve and Grant and others in saying our job, if we want to hear more, is to disrupt their plans. Find a way, find a wedge that will disrupt their plans. I'm hoping Danny has taught Lou in to doing a little disruption, just a little impulse so that we can see what the impulse response is. And yeah. I can hear him talking to Lou. The way the military gauges what the adversary is going to do is they poke the bear. They see what would happen when they fly their planes too close. They see what happens when they do certain actions. And like the British went into the Black Sea and the Russians shot at them. Who saw that in the last week? How many of you actually saw that? Okay, so we, we, we do that stuff all the time. And Lou will understand that language. I really believe that, that Lou's about to do something that's really going to stir the pot. And one thing to add to what you said is that Barack Obama suddenly went on TV and, and took UFO questions. He just suddenly. Yeah, and it's, but he said, he said that he had, she said the talking points. He was yeah. like, he was a research puppet. <laughs> nice. Oh my gosh. Uh, just to switch gears for a nanosecond, and then I'm going to kick it over to Sinead to ask a question. Bob, I know we often talk um, media coverage and mainstream media coverage you know, whether it could be a good thing or a bad thing. And I know a lot of people are like, oh my God, TMZ is doing a special. So did they give us some justice in what they're airing? You've seen a oh, little- Oh yeah, 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 no, 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 no. This is a completely, this is a completely like respectful, <laughs> completely respectful, completely well done. They're not talking trash talk. Mm. Corbell and Knapp are doing an excellent job of presenting. The producers they got involved did a very good job of organizing all of the evidence and all the all the high witnesses and the people that are testifying and, and so forth. But I only got to see 20 minutes of it right. before you and Melinda beat me up and told me to get on. So, the air. so, so far, so, so good, though. Okay. So, so far, so good. So far, so good. I don't know. For a moment there, I was like, great. We're reverting back to tabloidism to. Well, 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 let me let me let me bring up one more point about Washington. And Steve knows this because he's been there forever. Reporters are not going to bite the leg off and the arm off of the hands that feed them. Mm -hmm. If they if they go too far, they're going to get cut off and then they're isolated from their sources for information they publish every day. So it's a game. We have to play the game craftily enough and carefully enough that they are willing to go along and take a risk. And the risks have to be calculated because they don't want to suddenly be shut out of the White House or the Pentagon and never be able to report there again. I'm just telling you, the game has to be played craftily. 
Right. That's why that's why I said that the media has to be re manipulated and uh, th there's no other way to do it. Uh, the media manipulates everything in its own context, in its own favor. Uh, it's up to people who are well informed to re manipulate the media. Th there's no other way this is going to get out. You can talk. So I want to kind of jump off um, the last thing Bob was saying, but really it's it's a theme with everyone here or for me, it's an underlying theme anyway. There are so many layers and so many different sides to this topic, right? The topic of disclosure is so incredibly complicated, in depth, you know, detailed. There's so many possibilities, there's so much information. But what's often talked about is, you know, they, this word they, they will do this, they will do that, or they, you know, who is this they? So for the sake of our audience right now, the people who are listening to this, the people who are going to listen to this, when you guys talk about, and this is a question for everyone, so whoever wants to jump in first, you know, please just head, you know, head in there. Um, when you are saying that they are, and you're speaking about people in power who, you know, have full knowledge of what's going on behind the scenes, are the ones who are controlling the narrative, they have written the script, they are, you know, they've set the timeline, those people, who is that to you? Like, who are you thinking of when you say they? Because there's different theories that people float around, right? And a lot of them are very convincing. So what is it that you think? Who is it that you think is behind the scenes, so to speak, you know, orchestrating this theater? Steve, go ahead. What? Steve, your comments. Um, look, there's at least 20 things I need to respond to, and I'm not going to be able to. And so I, I've got to shift gears here. Look, the issue of they is directly dependent upon the specific thing that you're talking about, the specific area, the specific issue. It varies, all right? It, there is no almost, ev let me put it this way. Generally speaking, anytime somebody refers to they, they're not, they don't know. They don't know. Uh, it's, just, it's just a convenience, all right? There is... Every, every power center in this town has got a stake in this thing. CIA, military services, Department of Defense, the Senate, the House, the President. All of these things are, all of these entities rather, are assessing, reacting to, and dealing with this as best they can. And one of the reasons that we've actually got that milieu happening is because the TTSA surprised the military intelligence complex when they came out. They did not know they were coming. And for that, I give them a lot of credit. So whoever's behind them, and Semi Van has alluded to 20, 30, maybe 40 people back in there that are kind of, you know, well, they surprised them. So I'm sure the, the gears started grinding really hard inside the military intelligence complex. And in this case, the they refers to those within the complex who have no interest in seeing the truth embargo ended, no interest in this information getting out. But before they could get it together fast enough to come up with some sort of intense response, they walked the stories into the New York Times. They probably were in there within a week after the you know, after they launched, right? It was only 65 days between the two events. Gave the Times plenty of time to vet. Once the Times got the story, what are they gonna do? There's nothing they could do. When the stories came out, no. And so the collective opposition to a truth embargo coming to an end and disclosure taking place was caught unaware. So they had to sit back and say, let's see what happens now. Was there a plan? Yes, there was a plan within the TTSA. Who were the three people? Justice, Mellon, Elizondo. They knew what they wanted to do. They knew what the goal was and off they went. But they also knew that we had to launch. It wasn't our plan initially, but we had to launch in the middle of the most chaotic political situation in American history. So they knew that they couldn't move at the same pace they wanted to. If they really tried to get aggressive and actually blew the story up, well, this issue would have been addressed by the president at the time. And I think most of them felt that that may have not been something that he was capable of handling. So they went slow. 
happened. They went slow. They moved it along and made a little progress. One of the key things they did is start briefing Congress. One of the most important things that was in uh, Mark Warner's very limited and inadequate statement is he acknowledged three years ago I was briefed. And he's exactly referring to Mellon coming up and briefing the Intel Committee three years ago. So the Intel Committee has had three years to reflect on these unfolding events, but they didn't take any action. Again, the political situation was not conducive. Now, at some point, as we move towards 20, November of 2020, uh, at, well, let me put it this way. As we, as we finish up 2019, my guess is they're looking ahead and they're saying, okay, probably we're going to see a change of administration. And that's going to alter the political circumstances and maybe make it a lot easier for us to now continue and close the deal that we started off. Perfectly good idea and perfectly appropriate. They could not do anything until the current, that president's term was over. Now, if he had won again, hey, I have no idea what would have happened and it's not an issue now. But when you talk about planned events and randomness, they didn't see the pandemic coming. That was not in their plan. That wasn't in the scheme when they started this. First pandemic in a hundred years, which may end up being the worst pandemic in terms of body count in the history of the human race. So, blah, so slow down even more, right? And off it goes. Okay, so as you approach the, the election, the election is, uh, does change the administration, all good. The pandemic though is rocking and rolling still. And so moving forward, but overall, generally it was on, it was still on track. And I, and I have given a hundred interviews so far this year, a personal record, thank you. And, and this may be 101. The point is, is that it all looked good. But these delays, the pandemic, all of this other, oh, by the way, they didn't expect that the political chaos would continue after the election to quite the extent that it did. They sort of thought that if another president came into the White House or was elected, that that would mean a transition to a more stable situation. Another random thing that wasn't in their plan is thousands of people marauding the United States Capitol, which has never happened in the history of the country. They didn't see that coming either. And in fact, what we have seen is the situation that developed during the last administration has metastasized it is embedded and it's going to be around for a long time. So this has been a problem too. And yet they continued ahead because, and one of the things that allowed that was that Rubio made his move to put the language in the intelligence bill in July of 2020. And so the O&I and the Department of Defense knew a year in advance that a report was going to be due at some time, in this case, 180 days after it was signed. Didn't get signed till December. That put the deadline June 25. So six months on the, on the prescribed time period, a year of notification. And so the, the preliminary assessment has been put out to us as representing what they came up with for the public consumption over a period of a year. All right? And hey, so- let's go to- Let's go to Melinda uh, and see if she shares maybe some of the same thoughts or, or Melinda, what about, what about you? And if you're okay with it, if you can answer the, the they question, you know, who is it that you think is making these decisions? Who is it that wrote the script that writing, you know, that timed all of this out? Who are the people that Grant was referring to earlier? So um, even if, if you could be specific as possible and then anything else you'd like to say around that topic would be great. Um. <laughs> I think Steve stated it perfectly regarding they, and I don't mean to cop out. I have nothing else to say about that, Steve. I think Steve's, you know, uh, statement of, um, you know, that that it's those, um, you know, controlling the subject matter. It's those, uh, you know, it, it, obviously when we say they, we mean, you know, uh, in the context of this whole panel, we've been saying they, to reference the whole political body. But uh, I think, Steve, Steve, if I grasp you correctly, it's the DOD and, um, and, and 
you know, with, and their holding of this information. Um, you know, I, I keep thinking everyone and you can respond to this. This task force, my understanding is it was a small office, maybe two people, maybe a few more helping them. I don't know. Two. Okay, that's what Steve says. And I'm thinking they weren't given access to stuff. They were probably put in, in a difficult position. And um, and I think those they, if you will, my they, <laughs> is those really who are holding the real information. Uh, these guys didn't have access to it. It's in the SAPs and the USAPs, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, and and uh, and they were left having to do what they could do. Now, I'm hoping because we're talking about the fallout from the report here. I'm really hoping that. Senate and Congress move forward. I know we're, there's a congressional um, briefing, if I understand correctly, that's supposed to happen when they come back from their recess. Is that, Steve, you can tell me, and Bob probably can if I'm accurate about that, that, uh, that that's when Congress will be briefed. And I'm hoping that this is not the end, that it is the beginning, uh, that it is going to go on. And I think we just need to be patient in, in the community to see where it goes because um, things were left in the end of that report to say more information is needed, a bigger investigation, and that these incursions into our airspace are a threat to those operations going on at the time because of the way they interrupt them, et cetera. Yes, so much historical data was missing, um, but this is the beginning. And if this is all scripted, as Grant says, then it's scripted to begin a certain way to cause it to roll on, to cause it to go into, uh, as, as we, you know, as we were just discussing that uh, Elizondo said, third gear, you know, maybe, th maybe this is exactly happening the way it's supposed to. I, it's frustrating because we all want it now. Yeah. And I want it now. I'm an experiencer. I want it now. Sure. But at the same time, I'm, I'm not a part of that process. And uh, we're left, you know, listening to those that are a part of the process, give us information, whether that be a semi van or, or Chris Mellon or Lou Elizondo, you know, we're, we're left with, you know, we're all hearing stuff through the grapevine. Uh, Bob went away. Yeah. Nicole's Bob coming back. No, he no. had to leave. He had, he's got oh shoot bob had been saying recently i was so hoping he would get into it today about the um uh the the closed door briefing and this was it 73 page document we're hearing about and the 73 page document and the fact that these quotes that they saw 40 minutes of film footage it, it, am i stating this correctly like maybe Wars, steve yeah. Like yeah, you know, or Grant or Steve, you can address this, or or any or, or Tom or Victor, I don't whoever knows, but um, that there was this, you know, footage they were shown. I'm hoping that that they're going to continue on with this. That oh, hang on, Danny's calling me. <laughs> okay, Danny's I'll, calling I'll just, me. Go go on to someone else. I got to okay. I'm I gotta gonna catch go this. ahead. Go ahead and mute. Uh, uh, I'm gonna. I'll just give you quickly my th them because I say this is a battle between two sides. The, the um, of course, the people that are being caught off guard are the Department of Defense, which is 15 administrations who have all done the same thing, which basically the rule is curiosity is not sufficient, need to know we're running this thing, we're not releasing it. But the other side, as I said, was this, uh, Tom DeLong starts in 2015, he meets with Lockheed Skunk Works, he makes his pitch, and the one guy says to him, this may actually work. They send him to uh, Pentagon City, the same place where the meeting took place with with uh, Leslie Kane and, and, and all those uh, to the stars people. And these two guys are sitting behind the table and they said, stuff like this does not happen at the White House, it does not happen on the Hill. It happens when people like this behind tables decide to take the football and move it down the field. So the other side is all the people who uh, have um, want this thing out inside that are defecting, who think it should be pushed out. That would include all the regular people, Elizondo, Mellon, uh, Justice, but it also includes uh, Robert Weiss, who was the head of Lockheed Skunk Works, and J McCaslin from Wright Patterson Air Force Base, who actually wrote a memo. It's in the WikiLeaks. He actually wrote a memo on what to do when the disclosure takes place, and he talks about bringing in NASA. And it also involved McKay. And then when the WikiLeaks dropped, those guys had to drop out, but they may not have dropped out. 
There's a, there's a general from the National Reconnaissance Organization. There's a whole group of people that were pushing this thing. So that's the other side. These are people that want it out. So it's the, the people who want it out versus the people who don't want it out. I'm not hearing anything. Nicole is muted. Danny's just Mike, coming Mike, in Mike. right now. I was just letting Danny Sheehan into the room. So welcome, Danny. Here we go. Okay, you guys. There and we go. Well, Same mirror. Wrap this yeah. up real quick to throw That's my two cents in, and then we'll turn it over to Danny. Is <laughs> I woke up this morning. I think I mentioned to you guys my phone was fried, so I was cut off from the world, but I was still able to check emails. And I got an interesting email circuit from some of my experiencer group pals. And they were wondering if this third gear would involve any sort of social movement like a march or a protest in Washington, DC. And I was wondering if any of you guys had heard any inkling of kind of like a community movement to maybe show our support and or protest if that needed. So there's a protest schedule for July 2 in front of the White House. Yeah. Uh, but it's not a good idea. I tried to talk them out of it. This right. this issue is this marches on Washington are incredibly expensive, mm -hmm. uh, uh, ineffective. What, a lot of what media we need is we that. don't need boots on the ground, we need fingers on the keyboard. All right. Mm -hmm. So yes. We need a, a much more escalated social media engagement and attack form, almost like an attack focused. I don't know. It could be on, some on the media, some on the Congress. Uh, that kind of pressure is easy to generate. And, and there's enough basis now, I think, to support it. Get the news articles, a lot to share. So that's but that's just one part of what needs to happen. There's there's several other things. Wonderful. Hi, Danny Sheehan. How are you tonight? Hi, Paul. Sorry, sorry about getting hung up there. I had a, right. I had a, another appointment I couldn't get up, couldn't uh, avoid. I was had to do it. So uh, we just, I just came in the house right now. Welcome, <laughs> welcome. We've uh, just been talking the report and some spinoff questions and going around the panel, but I think we're anxiously awaiting for any sort of update from you. So. Grant, did you want to jump in with anything specific? Well, just we off this last question, this thing about the third gear, what, what, uh, is there a, a new plan that's, is there, a, is there a plan that's being initiated? And if so, what do you think is going to happen? Well, we don't know yet. I, I do know that the Lou and I uh, have another meeting with the inspector general's people. Uh, they have, as I'd indicated once before, they, they seem to have joined together now in a, a group of them from the differing subdivisions inside the Inspector General's office, uh, including the more general uh, evaluation of just exactly what type of steps have been taken uh, by the Defense Department at any time over time with regard to the UAP uh, issue. So that's, that's the broad one. And when we sat down with them the last time, what we did is try to say, look, let's gear all the divisions up, the whistleblower group, the group that's responsible for uh, space intelligence and engineering, the, also the one that's responsible for space um, uh, missiles and nuclear. You know, there's a whole bunch of different subdivisions that have all opened evaluations. What, what we did is, is uh, advocated that they bring them all together. Uh, and they did, they brought them all together in the meeting, the last meeting that we had uh, I'm advocating that they stay together like that so that we, that Lou and I have one focus of all the inspector general's people together uh, to push them. They said they wanted us to come back uh, probably in about uh, 30 days. Now that was on the 15th of June. Uh, we're waiting for the additional date uh, when to get back there. I'm, I'm quite sure they were waiting to see what was happening with regard to the report. Uh, that, uh, as you've talked about, Steve, it's, it's clear that the classified portion of the, uh, the uh, evaluation uh, is in the hands of the Senate Intelligence Committee, uh, and they're, they're in the process of determining some response other than the, the kind of limp-wristed uh, response that uh, the two Marks, Mark Rubio and Mark Warren, 
uh, gave to it to begin with. So they, they've got to look at the actual classified portion of it. Uh, any, anything of any substance, with the exception of a couple minor points, uh, is going to be in that classified portion. Uh, the, the six substantive pages uh, of the report uh, that was made public, uh, you know, they're like, like any, any deposition you take of an adversary, you look for the few concessions that they made to you you know, not all the self-serving, you know, you know, uh, molly coddling and ambivalence that they get into, but you look for some concession they've made. They, they, they've affirmed that they that the substantial majority of the hundred, just 144 uh, episodes or the encounters that they had evaluated, that the a substantial majority of them, they've said, were not our our scientific advanced technology, uh, and they they of course have tried to give the impression only though, uh, despite what was said by Walter in our discussion the other night, there's not a single word anywhere in the six pages about uh, terrestrial or non-terrestrial. They haven't, they haven't set aside the issue of extraterrestrial. They just didn't even mention it at all, uh, even though that's a major focus of Lou's discussions with them, uh, is that he believes that that, uh, that they've effectively eliminated for a substantial majority of these, these incidents, uh, any of our uh, highly sophisticated technology. And he has substantially eliminated the chances of it being either China or Russia. And so he's specifically focusing on the issue of whether it's extraterrestrial or extra dimensional or even extra temporal. You know, they, they've, they've uh, and they've, they've, there's a fourth one they've been looking at, <clears throat> which is, whether this is conceivably some other human civilization that has been able to maintain itself in some place where we haven't been able to find it under the ocean or under the earth somewhere uh, in bases. Th these are just things that they've been examining, but the, the overwhelming weight of all the evidence is that it's extraterrestrial, uh, but they aren't talking about it. You know, the, the, they don't say a word about it in the report, uh, and uh, you can bet your bottom dollar they probably don't say anything about it in the classified section either because they don't want to they don't want to have that that word past their lips. So uh, we're, we're we're trying to see whether there's going to be uh, you know a whole spine anywhere in the membership of the Senate Intelligence Committee to confront them to say look at what's the story here you know don't don't try to buffalo us that you know that this is all you've got on this so. So we're, but we can't, we can't get ourselves caught in uh, a position of kind of waiting for them to come forward. Uh, that we're, we've got to put as much pressure as we can through Steve's office and others, as much pressure as we can on the members of Congress themselves to demand this type of information. But it, it is true that we, we also, people who are even more fed up with government institutions uh, don't want to rely simply upon Congress either, because Congress and the executive branch will make some deal uh, to conceal as much as they can. So that that well, I don't I don't agree. I agree with you, Steve. I don't think it's a good idea to be marching up and down in front of the White House right now. Uh, I do think that, however, moving with all of our sources in the media and getting all the media sources to go digging in on these guys and go after all of their sources and get at the content of the classified portion of this. And so that rather than us, you know, tilting at the windmill of this six page nothing burger that they let out, you know, mm -hmm. we, need to, we need to engage that classified portion uh, and point out the, the pitfalls of it, the holes that are in it, the things they didn't talk about, you know, and then force somebody inside the inspector general's office through our conversations with them to actually undertake an actual investigation of this. You know, that's, that's the key. There, there are several different points of entry on this all along the line. And I think it has to be, you know, all in all of the above. We have to push like mad. Now there's going, there are going to be people that are, that are, I think I might say less sophisticated than we are here in this group, you know, who are going to want to go out and march up and down in the streets and, and uh, you know, do protests and hang banners off of bridges and things like that. <laughs> You know, and you know, it's not it's not our job to denigrate them. It's just, it's just I don't think that those of us who have spent decades in this together, that you know, that we necessarily have to be devoting our attention to those type of activities. Mm -hmm. We need to be looking at much more professional avenues in 
dealing with our, our media sources and their sources, our journalists, investigative journalist sources to get at this information. So the next Danny, thing to get uh, at that the classified portion of the report. I'd like to ask you a question, Danny. Yes. Um, I've, I've been reading like the National Security Act and Executive Order 12333 mm. and various DOD directives. Yep. And the language that they use is that their responsibility is for threats uh, against foreign countries, mainly, yep. or maybe terrorist groups. And we all believe that the U.S. government has been secretly investigating and dealing with the UFO problem since at least uh, the 1940s. My question to you as a lawyer is, where is their legal authority to do that? Because it appears to me that, at least in theory, the government doesn't do anything without some legal authority behind it. Well, uh, th th this, that's, a, that's a complex constitutional question. The, the issue is that the federal government, as was created in 1789 in the first three articles, and then the Bill of Rights in 1791, the, the entire original anticipation was that this was going to be a government of extremely limited powers. Uh, and they had to be specifically delegated specific authority from mm -hmm. the people uh, to have any authority to do any one of those things. Uh, and to the extent to which they have not recognized anywhere that the extraterrestrial civilization may be a foreign entity with whom they're going to have diplomatic relations, uh, it, it would, it would uh, fall under there. Uh, the, the, the president of the United States has been explicitly delegated authority in the constitution you know, in, in, uh, in uh, Article 2, where he is specifically authorized to engage in foreign relations with uh, other nations. Uh, now, my, my assumption is that the lawyers inside the Defense Department would be characterizing the extraterrestrial civilization as a foreign nation. But nowhere in any of their documents that they've ever made public or any public statements they've ever made have they been willing to concede that there is such an entity, that there is any such extraterrestrial civilization. So they, they've not at least publicly attempted to garner under themselves any type of jurisdictional authority to be, to be uh, applying their trade in this area. But on the other hand, it's, it'd be perfectly evident to me that their lawyers in-house would be asserting to them that they have the authority to proceed under the treaty making authority under the foreign uh, relations and foreign negotiations authority of the president. And that's why they believe that it's an exclusive area for the jurisdiction of the executive branch. Uh, and that's why they're as reluctant as they are, I'm sure, to even discuss it with the legislature. Uh, th they don't believe that the legislature has any legitimate authority here. Uh, now, so, so that's, there, there's this debate undoubtedly this has been going on for a long time between the executive branch and the legislative branch. There's one United States Supreme Court uh, case on this and it's uh, Youngstown sheet and tube. It was, a, it was a Supreme Court decision where Truman during the, uh, during the Korean War uh, took it upon himself to assert authority to go in and take over the steel mills in Youngstown uh, uh, because the people went on strike. And what he did is he, without authority of the Congress, went in and uh, commandeered the steel mills uh, and said that he had the authority to do that under his jurisdiction for protecting the national security. Uh, the United States Supreme Court slapped him down and said, no, no, you don't. Uh, you're not the government, in fact. The Congress of the United States is the government. Uh, and what we've got to do is convince the Congress of that. <laughs> And that's, that's Steve's job. You, you know, you, you, gotta, you gotta get the Congress people to understand that they do have jurisdiction uh, in this area. The president does not have exclusive jurisdiction. The executive branches certainly can't assist. They have exclusive jurisdiction even to the exclusion of the president. <laughs> they certainly can't get away with that. So, so we, we've, got to, we've got to keep the pressure on in every single avenue that we have. You know, and as I say that, that those of us here, probably our, our area of, of uh, constituency really ranges from 
you know, the progressive element to the left of center, to the liberals to the left of center, to the moderates in the middle, and people even to the moderate right of center, you know, it's basically our constituency. Once you get too far off into the right wing, you know, we, we tend to start losing traction and lose credibility with some of those people. And if you get too far to the left, we probably don't have a lot of credibility with them either. So both of those elements are probably going to do whatever it is they're going to do uh, with regard to this issue. We have to concentrate on these groups around the middle and to the left of center and right of center to try to mobilize this major majority constituency in our country to demand that the Congress of the United States move into this area right now. Uh, and just, um, it's a political issue. Just, just one short point, though. Is it possible because there isn't any language other than, say, foreign countries or terrorist groups? Yeah. But because of that, the people in the DOD are making the argument, we don't have any authority to deal with this. So no, we should deal no, with no, it. No, no, they're not doing that. I can tell from talking to them, you know, that what, what, they're, what they're more concerned about is what the scope of the jurisdiction of the inspector general's office is. You know, they're, they're still trying to figure out whether they're like an internal affairs department in the police department, whose job it is, is to exonerate every police officer who's been charged with anything. You know, if they think that their job is to try to protect the defense department against any kind of complaints of any kind, uh, and basically serve as the lawyers for the defense department against anybody who complains. What we're trying to do, Lou and I are in the process of trying to convert them into understanding that they're supposed to be watchdogs uh, over the Defense Department. Uh, and that the Defense Department is engaged in, you, you, can, you can lay out across the entire spectrum of how you want to characterize what the government is doing. Either this is the most abject experience of complete incompetence on their part, which I don't think it is. I don't think it's true with them just saying, well, you know, yeah, these UFOs are coming over our nuclear missile sites and shutting off our missiles, but we can't be bothered about this, you know, because uh, we, we can't figure out what they are. So we're not going to do anything at all. You know, they've been hovering around our warships, but we don't know what they are. So we're not doing anything. Nobody, nobody here is doing anything. That's not true, you know. And, and the problem is that the inspector general's office doesn't, can't really tell so far who it is that's in charge up there because their immediate superiors, the, 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 the general officers, the uniformed officers, don't seem to know about this, a lot of them. You know? And so the question is, as we're putting to them, who is in charge? You know, at least the inspector general's office to try to figure out who's in charge here. You know, that somebody inside the defense establishment has to be responsible for trying to coordinate information about this phenomenon. You know, no matter, no matter how critical we are of them treating it as a threat or pretending it's a threat, when people think it isn't the, the, the most surprising thing, Lou, Lou Alessandro, the thing that he said more often than anything in any of our meetings with them is that, look, he said, I know positively from spending 10 years in that shop at the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification the, uh, Project that nobody in the high command is treating these phenomenon as if they're a threat. <laughs> they're just not doing that. Uh, and he can't understand it. Uh, now he has not he has not gone to the lengths of saying well I must assume that you know Eisenhower met with him in 1954 and they've worked out some deal and therefore they have some kind of treaty arrangement and that's why they all know about it they were not doing anything uh, he hasn't even suggested anything like that he is still saying that look there's got to be some reason for why the major military defense establishment isn't treating these objects as though they're a threat because they're not they're not acting as though they're a threat. Uh, now, he, for some period of time, some thankfully limited period of time, thought that he would step into that vacuum and say, well, let's, let's treat them like a threat and see if we can get Congress to do anything about that. And he, he did do that for a while. It has generated some response. Uh, Rubio was responding to that type of stimuli and said, hey, let's take a look and see if these are a threat. Uh, you know, but the fact is, Rubio doesn't believe they're a threat. You know? And, uh, and uh, Mark Warner doesn't believe they're a threat. Uh, that nobody believes they're a threat. So what we've got to find out is what they do believe about these things and, and where they think they're coming from. And boy, do they not want to go near that question. They I think, can answer your question, Danny. Yeah. Okay. You've asked a couple of questions here. One, the reason that the United States government doesn't know, uh, doesn't believe they're a threat is because possibly no government in the world or certainly no group of people in the world outside of our government and the people inside our MIC know more about this issue. 
No, that's right. Studying it for 70 years. So they right. have a very clear idea what they are and what they're willing to do. So I can understand why internally they would say it's not a threat. The reason the threat issue is up and out there is, and, and, and Melinda could ask uh, Jim Semivan anytime, is that as part of the initial plan of the TTSA, the fundamental goal was to get hearings because yes. they knew if they got the witnesses in, in testimony, the public was able to watch it happen. Yes. It would open the door for disclosure. But in order to get hearings and in order to get the press to be on board, like the New York Times do this article, right? Well, the New York Times could have said, I don't think so is that you have to raise the potential threat aspect of this, which is legitimate. They turn off our nuclear weapons. So one is part of a strategy to get to hearing so the witnesses can testify. And I know many of these witnesses, and when they do testify under oath, they will say, we don't think it's a threat. But first you've got to get the hearings. Mm -hmm. So this disconnect is along those lines. And yeah, technically, why don't we just together and agree? No, because there is a competing factions here. This is a complicated process, so we have no threat inside, need a threat outside. In fact, the people that are putting forward the potential threat, they don't think it's a threat. The point yeah. is we have to deal with the Congress we have and the media we have. And national security has got to be the platform that gets the media we need and the, uh, the, the hearings we need. Though, of course, we don't want to go overboard on this. We well, don't that's, that's, that's the exact point I've had with Lewis. I said, well, you got to be careful about going down that road because you know down, down through history, uh, people have gotten into all kinds of pretending that a certain thing is true until it got so carried away they couldn't get unhooked from it, you know. Uh, and so that that we that we've got to get them to back away from this threat thing. Uh, but at the same time, you're right that the the way that the, the congressional representatives, because they they hold their constituency usually in such low regard, they pretend that they think they have to treat it like a threat in order to justify doing it to their constituency. <laughs> you know, I mean, this is, it's a very peculiar thing in the, the, what I'm suggesting is that I've told them, I said, I think this is too dangerous to think you're playing three dimensional chess here, you know, doing double inside head fakes with each other. Uh, this is too important an issue to be caught and gaming this thing that way that we, we've got to get somebody. To, now, my, my sense is that the, that the Senator, the Senator from Oregon uh, is, is uh, on the Senate Intelligence Committee, uh, and uh, he's a he's a very solid guy. I'm trying to think of who his name is. Uh, who is he, uh, Steve? The the uh, the two senators from Oregon. Uh, I, I wasn't aware they'd said anything. Hines yeah. said something. But he's senator from uh, I think New Mexico. No, this, uh, what is, uh, what am I not thinking of his name here? But anyway, the, 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 both the senators from from Oregon are both very progressive guys, and one of them is on the Senate Intelligence Committee. Uh, he's a, a completely legit, stand-up, honest guy. You know, if we had somebody like White House, like Sheldon Whitehouse from Rhode Island on the Intelligence Committee, you know, that we'd have someone honest we can talk with. I believe that we can talk to some of the people that are there uh, in the Intelligence Committee and have them conduct themselves like honest persons, you know, who don't have to try to bamboozle their constituency into mm -hmm. thinking they're, we're, we're getting attacked from outer space or something yeah. to have hearings on this. Danny, uh, the senators from Oregon are Ron Wyden yes, and right. Jeff That's Merkley. Right. That's right. R Wyden, Wyden. Wyden. Uh, Ron Wyden, Wyden and Merkley. Yeah, Ron Wyden is the guy that I think that we ought to direct some attention to. Uh, Steve, you ought to get on the horn to him and his staff because mm. uh, I, I think that they're, he's, a, he's an honest guy. Uh, he usually comes right straight from the shoulder, and he's one of the very few people that you ever see in any of these uh, hearings asking honest questions you know, and really trying to get answers to things. And so uh, he's on the intelligence committee. He has a perfectly legitimate right to get some of these answers, even if all the rest of his, his compatriots, you know, are playing some kind of shadow game of pretending that it's a threat when they don't think it's a threat. You know, that I, I think we've, we've got to do something like that to get some honest people here on this issue, trying to force these hearings and have honest hearings where at least some of the people are not asking just prearranged, choreographed questions back and forth, you know, with these witnesses who are all pre-rehearsed, you know, to hold. And that's that not going to happen. That's not going to happen. You can't pre-rehearse military witnesses. By the way, I am approaching the the communications director and chief of staff of every member of Congress who speaks on the subject. If I can find that the two Oregon people have actually said something, then I'll approach them. Right. Well, why, um, let's say Wyden, Wyden's on the intelligence committee, Steve. So he's, he's got to have gotten this report. 
you know, so he's an, and I don't, I don't think he's going to tell us what's in it, but I think he, he will respond honestly. I don't think he's going to be trying to con his constituency into pretending that there's a threat is simply in order to get a hearing. He knows that they have a right to have legitimate hearings without making up stories. Well, let, let me ask, let me ask you a question, Danny. Let, let, uh, Mark Warner in his uh, uh, statement about the preliminary assessment mentioned, I was briefed three years ago. He's referring to the Mellon briefing. Yes. Which might have been one on one. It might have been the entire Intel committee. Could have been just him and Rubio. But he, it was three years ago that he was briefed. That's how long this has been bubbling over there. But let, put yourself in Mellon's shoes. If you, you're going up on the hill, you've got some military witnesses perhaps with you, and you're going to talk with, with the chairman of the committee. In that case, it was Rubio. And you're going to probably almost certainly suggest we ought to have some hearings on this. What would be the reason that you would give Marco Ruby to, because you, anytime you call a hearing, you take a political risk, right? What will be the reason you give Marco Ruby why he should call those hearings? Well, I don't, I don't think until, until, uh, in, until Chris and Lou made the decision to go public with these videos, I don't think there was any, uh, any argument that you could have made to any of these people in the Senate Intelligence Committee or in the Congress to have any hearings because there's no advantage to them. To oh, I know. No, before, you had to have the New York Times first. That's out. That's yeah. it. He goes up about a year later and starts talking to everybody. But yeah. still, the goal is, uh, Senator Rubio, we think we should have hearings in front of the Intel Committee. And Rubio is going to say, why? What reason do you give him? Well, the, look, at the, the, what we have to do is we have to be candid about the fact that the, the, Congress, the Congress distrusts the average people in the country as much as the military and the national security state distrust right. Congress. Yeah. You know, the, the, there's this whole hierarchy of, of secrecy uh, in believing that they're the ones in charge of the, the, the you know, crown jewels. Uh, and they, that it's only a last resort of any kind that they bring them out into public hearings. And that's usually when the, the, the Congress is at odds with some executive branch and they're trying to put pressure on them. And they're trying to sort of wag their, their witnesses out in front of the American people so they can sort of manipulate sort of the, the people with the pitchforks and the torches outside the, the Congress trying to make them do something. Uh, yeah, they, but Danny, and, that's the arena. That's the arena, okay? Uh, what it is, the arena is what it is. What is the reason that you give Rubio to hold the hearings? It's a straightforward question. Well, his, his, was, his was that he pretended that there was a threat. Okay, that and was, well, that, that's what he, he did. Said threat. He may not have said threat. All he had I to just, say I just want to recognize yes, that uh, Victor's had his hand up for uh, quite a while. I'm sorry, I don't yes. want to cut it off. It's just Victor's had his hand up for quite a while. So yeah, I just Victor. want to recognize that and give Victor the opportunity to come yeah. in and then yes. we can go back. Steve and I have gone like this forever. Yeah, he and I, Danny can go on for days. <laughs> oh, yeah. go, ahead, go ahead, Victor. I, I've heard that before, so I'm pretty aware of that. Yeah, it's it's. I want. I'll probably take this thing in a totally different direction, and I, I do want to pursue some of the things that that uh, Danny and Steve are talking about, but because it, it is a political question, it's absolutely no doubt about it. But um, I, I've lived next door to the elephant for seventy three years here yeah. up here in Canada. Yeah. And you know, you all know who the elephant yeah. is, and sure. whether it's in a room or not, I'm not quite sure. But in terms of of, um, of of controlling the narrative about this issue in the broadest possible aspects of it, okay, uh, the United States has attempted to control the narrative on just about every single issue across the planet in one way or another. We all know that. That's no surprise, okay? And they have every right to do that because, uh, you know, there are certain, uh, you know, people on the block who want to take control and, and the U.S. is in is in, is in a good position to do that in many different ways, politically, militarily, even sociologically. Uh, but in terms of ownership and jurisdiction of this issue, um, first of all, who says this is an American issue, number one, and to what extent might the extraterrestrials completely by themselves and of their own volition, completely bypass the, U the United States government on this issue? Uh, let's throw that around for a second. Well, sure. this, this is always the $64,000 question is what, what is what is the agenda of the extraterrestrials? Uh, is there some sort of coordinated agenda? Are there a whole series of these some 60 or so different star systems or planetary systems that are sending beings here? You know, what, what, type, of, what type of collective agenda do they have? Uh, and that's, that's the, the question of, in a sense, stepping over the head 
stepping over the head of Congress, stepping over the head of the, the executive branch, going directly to the, the extraterrestrials. And that's why this movement is people are talking about is trying to have direct established contact and communication with the extraterrestrials themselves. This is what John Mack and I were talking about back in 1994. We said, look at, we've got, we've got people here uh, who we're talking to who have regular encounters with extraterrestrials. It's, you know, of all the different people who say, yeah, I'm talking to extraterrestrials, you know, they come into my bedroom, whatever. You know, th there are some of them who we deem to be very credible people. It wasn't denigrating the others that we hadn't yet come to that affirmative conclusion on, but there were a handful of people that John and I were both very confident were having genuine contact experiences. And so what we did is started talking with some of them to try to train them to, as I've mentioned this before, you know, that had a couple of them go and get training from uh, Stanislav Graf to take the holotropic breathing exercises, et cetera. So when, when this experience started to happen again, another encounter, because they have these encounters fairly regularly, that they would do the holotropic breathing and calm way down and not get terrified, not threaten the extraterrestrials so that they had to freeze them. So then they get more frightened because they're all frozen and they, they can't move very well. You know, so that what we've done, we started that process just before John was tragically killed uh, over in London. Uh, but the, the, the bottom line is, is that that, that program that we did this back during the relations with the Soviet Union. There were a whole bunch of us that were engaged in what they call dip citizen diplomacy. And we were engaged in going back and forth to the Soviet Union, meeting with the citizenry, uh, meeting with some of the officials individually. The, the citizens were making perfectly clear to the Soviet Union uh, and some of their leaders and their citizens that look, the American people don't harbor the same kind of weird, paranoid, delusional attitudes uh, toward the Soviet Union that a lot of the military personnel do and some of the politicians do because they think they need to. Uh, you know, and so that we opened up that whole channel of communications with Gorbachev you know, uh, to talk about Gulashinost and Perestroika and get them to start coming forward, be more honest about their history. We were for t working to get our country to be more honest about uh, our uh, history, you know, with overthrowing governments and, and assassination programs and drug smuggling and all that stuff. And so that what we did is we established a protocol with people from the Soviet Union that really began a process that began to give them some space where they felt that they could actually take some initiative to, to step back away from the Cold War. What, what I'm saying is that we're, we're far from having the, the, the capacity to do this now, but I think that we have to consider supplementing the various other avenues that we're pursuing you know, with direct com communication with the Defense Department through Lou and the Inspector General, you know, with, the, with the Congress people, with the media people, you know, et cetera. Now, I think that we have to try to figure out how we would best go about attempting to establish diplomacy, citizen diplomacy with the occupants of the UFOs. Uh, now, that, that I know that people who spend our lives working with Congress and working with the executive branch and, and have developed a whole set of what we like to at least perceive ourselves as having some kind of special skills in working at, at, at this chess game of how to get policy done. But I think this one is a very, very important one that we need to put as a quiver in our, uh, or an arrow in our quiver. We've got to do everything we can do to see if we can reach out and establish direct communication uh, with ex the extraterrestrial beings to try to communicate with them, to get them to understand that there's a growing constituency of our human family that is not uh, trying to threaten them, is but but are sophisticated. You know, didn't fall off some you know country bumpkin wagon here and think, oh well, we're just going to open up our arms and invite them all in. You know, I mean, I don't think they would respect that. I mean, they would think we're as stupid as they thought they were before we even knew enough to talk with them. You know, and so that I I think that we've got to we've got to figure out a sophisticated program for communicating with the extraterrestrial uh, beings to try to open up this diplomacy, to get them to, I mean, it sounds a little presumptuous of trying to figure out how we can help them feel more comfortable, even though we don't feel that comfortable dealing with our own government. You know, I mean, I know I don't trust them, you know, uh, and I, I, we all know more, 
we we don't know as much about them as the extraterrestrials probably do, but what we do know causes us not to trust them. I mean, I sure I sure wouldn't want to be uh, suggesting we sit across the table from an extraterrestrial civilization with Henry Kissinger representing us, or you know, or Ronald Reagan, or W. Bush, or George Cheney, or you know, or, or Richard Cheney. I mean, what are we talking about here? I mean, we have all kinds of people in our human family who are vastly superior to these people to have honest. All the people you just mentioned have probably been running the cover up for the last 30 years. Well, they've, they've, they've been involved in it. That's for sure. That's for sure. Uh, and what we, what we have to do is try to figure out the, 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 mo the main thing we do, these kind of conversations that we're having here now, and we've been having now fairly intensely for the last few months, is the right process. How do we all get the, all the people together who've been devoting our lives to this, you know, for, for the last four decades, <laughs> three decades at least, you know, uh, to, to try to figure out how we're going to do this? How are we going to move collectively to reach out and try to open this line of communication with the extraterrestrials to see if we can get them to help change their position on this thing? Uh, and and you know, hopefully they're going to communicate to us and say things like, hey, look, <laughs> you know better than that. You know, you, until you guys can get rid of these buffoons that are basically running your, your government institutions and you can stop them from, you know, building massive nuclear weapons to try to threaten each other's civilizations here, you know, you, know, you can understand why we're reticent. You know, it, it, we'd have to acknowledge that. We'd have Annie, to I've got to respond. I've got yeah. to respond to this. Yeah. Uh, not everything, right? Your politics and mine are somewhat similar, but don't tell anybody, all right? Um, Look, there's a reason why the contact issue has been almost completely left out of the game plan of the TTSA with respect to uh, one episode of the, of the Unidentified series. By the way, I'm in a very calm state right now, not like I was with Mark Sims the other day, okay? So don't worry, all right? I blew my top, it's all right, no problem, I'm good. And there is a reason for that. So if the contact or the ET contact, human contact thing, somehow, I'm not talking about later, I'm talking about right now as we're in the, the, the maybe the throes of finishing this off, gets into this, the, the blood of most of the members of Congress will literally turn to ice. It could blow the hearing possibilities completely out of the water. And so I would very much recommend that uh, you know, Stephen Greer has been doing the reach out global CE5 contact ET since the 1980s. It's been out there a long time. But if people connected to this ongoing effort now, such as yourself dealing with Lou Elizondo and myself supporting the TTSA or whatever, anybody in the group puts out this idea that in addition to a strong social media engagement, which is fine, we need to reach out to the ETs and go past the government and do a, a ET diplomacy thing, which kind of puts us in the, the, the area of the realians. Danny, it could be a catastrophe. And so I'm suggesting, I like the idea, could you hold off until we get the hearings and see what happens then and then move into the air? Because most of what you're talking about that is completely appropriate for the post-disclosure world. Once the president makes a simple announcement, there's an extraterrestrial presence, hey, Doors open. Want to go? Let's go. Let's go meet ETs. Talk to ETs. Let's communicate. Whatever. Let's show them that we like them. Whatever. Post disclosure, but pre disclosure, it's practically a knife in the heart of the disclosure process. Steve, that's why they haven't beamed you up yet. <laughs> You're telling them to wait. You're saying wait. I don't. Yeah, I am. I, I'm telling them to wait Hold because you know, there, there is a reason why there is a time thing here. A lot of people go, you know, they want to initiate this. They want to get something going. We're at the beginning of this and the beginning of that. And Danny knows this. Melinda. There is a time frame here. And you want to know what that time frame is? And, and, and you don't think about it because it's not talked about. The reporters don't talk about it. The politicians don't talk about it. But I know about it. Danny knows about it. And that's this. We are always this close to a nuclear war. This close. You have any hopes and dreams? You have any kids or grandkids or anything else? You're that close to seeing it all gone. We could have it tomorrow. There's enough going on in this world to trigger nuclear war in at least eight different locations. And I, I, and I don't know how, barring a dramatic change, that we can possibly avoid one. The Bulletin of Atomic Scientists agree. They got the damn thing at 100 seconds to midnight. It could be 40 seconds to midnight. 
And so the only thing I think that could possibly prevent this from happening, and it's no guarantee, is that we get disclosure we get the confirmation that we're not alone, and we start addressing our world in the context of the post-disclosure world. And so anything that puts off disclosure, including some uh, ONI, let's take 90 days to look at this some more, or anything that could delay it, just puts us still that close to the nuclear war. And I am not, I am not, I'm not being over the top here. I'm being dead on serious. It's not funny, Nicole. You are lucky to be alive. We have been, danced on this edge of the volcano for this entire 73 years. We've almost had a nuclear war six times. Do you know that? I keep smiling because messages from the experiencers, though, are they won't let it get to a nuclear war. If it comes you to believe, that, that you, will you, be you a are willing to bet the, 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 so the, 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 the future of Steve, the human Steve, race. Steve, 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 don't talk over her. Don't talk over her. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Don't talk over her. We can't. We can't. We can't. There's no way we can risk that. I've got extra. Yeah, I've got, I've I've got contact. Your life, you, you know, see, you're still talking over her. Yeah, I am. On the nuclear button. That's been my entire life. I'm 40 years old. And I agree. Let me let me segue it into this, and then I want to let Melinda talk. Danny, I had a wonderful conversation with your wife at MegaCon. Mm -hmm. Please tell her I said hi. I will do that. I will. We had this whole discussion about how to bring in cohorts into you into ufology or mm -hmm. people that could help our cause. Some people would be the nuclear activists that want to shut down nuclear plants. Some right. other people would be environmental activists. You know, how could we get them on board? And okay. I guess my question to you is, how do we approach them as ufologists to get them on our team? I think we already support the actions they're taking, but how do we turn that table and get them to join our cause? We, we, point, we point out, the first thing is, is that we, we've got to get a, a, a sub substantial portion of those two constituencies, the anti-nuclear weapons, the anti-nuclear power, uh, and the environmentalists, the, the people trying to stop global climate change, to really understand, first of all, that the UFOs are real, okay? Uh, and, and we've got to get past this baloney about, oh, they're possibly Chinese or Russian. We've got to get past that. Uh, we're pretty close to that spot now. Once they come to grips with the fact that they're real and a, an actual conversation starts to come about them being extraterrestrial. Uh, the, the, the one thing, as Steve just pointed out, the one thing that none of the people in the Defense Department are talking about are the contact experiences. All they want to talk about is UFO stuff and how fast do they go and how, 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 how many Gs are they pulling and what's their propulsion system. You can't hardly get them to talk and, about that. that. That's right, barely. And, and now you've got tens of thousands of these encounter experiences that they just, and, and I can tell you, when we raised, the, when I raised this issue with the people in the Inspector General's office, they just stood there like deer in the headlights. Uh, and it wasn't because they, they just refused to talk about it, right? They, they won't respond at all. Uh, and so that, that we've got to get our people to cross this line to realize not only that UFOs are real and not only that they're extraterrestrial, but to engage them, my opinion is one of the best levers we've got is the, I, I, you heard me announce it, the, the, the Catholic Church has issued very specific requests to have people start the serious conversation about what the full philosophical and theological implications are of the existence of an extraterrestrial civilization. Uh, they've said it, they've solicited this. I'm working like mad to get, get uh, Peter Turkson, who's the head of the, the Papal Commission on Social Justice, and Francis. I'm trying to get them to say it, you know, to, to come forward and say it again. Uh, look, now it's time for us to have this serious discussion about this. And that once, once we can get people understanding that that serious discussion is being solicited by other people that they consider to be authority figures, then what we start doing is getting people that are involved in trying to stop global climate change, people that are trying to stop nuclear war, people that are trying to stop nuclear power. But we get them to say, look at, lighten up here. I've come to understand this is true. The, what we've been telling you is true. These are allies. And the fact is, is that there's a huge plurality of the contact experiences in which the people, the extraterrestrial beings are telling our people. 
to stop the nuclear weapons program, stop mm -hmm. the nuclear power program because it's going to contaminate your whole planet and, and stop contaminating your environment with all these, these fossil fuels because you're destroying your climate system. Okay, That's the step that we need to take. And so we need to build our movement by bringing these people in so that they can view this as a legitimate conversation now in that we constitute a legitimate ally for them in their movements. And, and that's the kind of a coalition that we need to, we need to build. We need to build a coalition of, of the, the people that are trying to get exposure and disclosure of the UFO phenomenon and a reality of extraterrestrial civilization with the anti-nuclear weapons people, the anti-nuclear power people, and the people that are fighting global climate change. This is a coalition that has legs. This is a coalition that can then see their synergy and, and move together. And, and this is the kind of thing that starts to, to give some backbone to the Congress people to say, okay, 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 look at, we've got a, a genuine political coalition getting built out there among the citizenry. And so therefore we get some space where we can have some genuine inquiries into this. I mean, there's, there's not a gen, I mean, every single one of the Congress people, senators and congressmen that I brought people to sit down with during the disclosure project, where we would bring, you know, a, a military officer from one of these nuclear missile sites that had all these missiles turned off. We would bring them and sit down with their congressperson and they would tell them about this. And their congressperson would say almost to the, to the, the senator and congressman, okay, okay, I, I consider this a really important issue, but you just can't talk about this up on the Hill. You can't talk about it. You know, that there's a few people I can speak with privately about this, but it would destroy our career because the campaign that was mounted by the Defense Department and the Central Intelligence Agency and the National Security State to destroy the reputations and careers of the people who tried to do anything about this has been so effective that what we're, we're right at the brink right now of starting to, to vitiate some of that. Uh, and that's, I mean, to be sitting, to be sitting at the, in the Defense Department with the Inspector General's office across the table, having a face-to-face -face conversation with them about extraterrestrial intelligence is the first time, the first time that they've had any civilians uh, in there talking with them about this. And that's what's going on right now. You know, so that I, I, that's what I, that's the kind of coalition I think that we really need to build. You've had you've had made this comment several times. I'm going to bring it up, and in a way, I'm not sorry I brought this up, but um, you've made this comment before, and it's another strain of this whole business of ownership of this issue. Um, uh, in, in if we cannot get our act together, just with respect to the nuclear weapons issue, leave all of the others aside for now. If we continue to, to, to propagate this kind of uh, what I call extinction behavior, and it will land up as Steve is, is, uh, is saying, it could be an eventual extinction behavior for the whole planet. Yeah. If we cannot um, uh, get this under control and we get to the next echelon of getting these weapons into space, getting these nuclear weapons uh -huh. into space mm -hmm. and somehow uh, putting ourselves out into the rest of the solar system or yeah. as far as we can get, uh, you've made the point a couple of times, Danny, if we, if we do, do talk to us about that for a second. Well, no, so we say, say it again, Victor, you conked out right there. So Sorry. Just take that. Okay. You, you mentioned the idea, if we can't get our nuclear weapons under control, uh, and the, the military continues to put these things out, not just on the planet itself, but take them into space mm -hmm. and, and become a, a, a nuclear threat in space, yeah. that the extraterrestrials have the capacity to quarantine the planet so that mm -hmm. we won't get as far as the moon if we, if we, if we go in that direction. We, w we will, in fact, be quarantined. No, I, 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 I think that's true. I do think that's true. Uh, and the, the, we're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to display the fact that we have the capacity as a human family to pull that tiny percentage of our population that assert this kind of uh, elite control over policies that we can get control over these people and pull them back from bringing these nuclear weapons out into space. And we can pull them back and get them to disassemble these nuclear weapons. That, that we've got to be able to demonstrate as a species that we have the capacity to do that. You know, the, the, you know we, we watch these bad movies where some uh, person back in the middle ages, some feudal lord is, is standing there looking at a hundred of the peasants uh, and he's got like two soldiers with him and he's threatening them to give them half of their crops. And they all sit there and go, well, okay, here, take them. 
you know, and then they whine and cry about it, you know, instead of jumping up and kicking their ass and throwing them in the dirt, you know, and, and kicking them out of their county. You know, I mean, the, we, we've got to be willing to stand up and disempower this elite. We've got to be able to do that because I think that in a sense is one of the sine qua nons of demonstrating to the extraterrestrial civilization that we're worthy of having some diplomatic relations with them, you know, and that we aren't going to be tendering these no neck buffoons that are, that are asserting their power over us to be the people we're going to send out as our representatives and having diplomatic communications with them. You know, I mean, my guess is, is that if they've tried to reach out and have a communications with the extraterrestrial people, the extraterrestrial people, <laughs> excuse me, uh, we'll wait, we'll wait for some better people uh, before we're going to get very far down this road. Our job is to deliver those better people and get rid of these, this elite. Yes, Melinda. Uh, as you were talking about and Steve was too, about the threat of nuclear war and everything. It, it made me reflect on, for instance, today I saw this beautiful piece uh, put up um, on Mystery Wire of Robert Hastings. It's from 2016, apparently it's not new, but it was Robert Hastings talking very passionately about all the events uh, involving nuclear facilities, nuclear weapons storage, et cetera, et cetera, and ET. Mm -hmm. um, and then it combined with the, the lovely post that Bob Salas put up today, it got me really thinking about that. And as you guys are saying this, I think the answer to this ending nuclear, you know, insanity and pushing towards war and, and everything that continues um, is in this, is, is in this disclosure um, or what would be a proper disclosure and certainly hearings and whatever if we get into the fact that the ETs have been so concerned and and in one of my own abduction experiences I was shown earth blowing up and the ETs said do not because I thought they really did it I thought earth blew up in front of me it was a very very powerful and emotional experience but the ETs turned to me afterwards and said, after I realized, because then they showed me Earth was fine, <laughs> they said, don't ever let this happen. Yeah. And I think that this, this part of what could be in hearing, Steve, is, is the, the nuclear part. We started this conversation today mentioning that, and now we're back to it again. I think it absolutely is needed, and, and it has to be addressed in this current disclosure process. How, I guess my question would be back to you guys to say, how do we get that to happen? How do we get that, that evidence of, like Robert Hastings was saying, of the involvement in, in shutting off nuclear weapons and fly over nuclear installations, everything. How do we get that paid attention to? And Dan, have you discussed this with Lou? I'm sure you have, but mm -hmm. how do we get that into the conversation. Yeah, I think that this, as you, you all know, that this, this discussion that's going on with Lou Elizondo, you know, in my capacity as his counsel is, you know, to, to be clear, it, I think is extraordinarily important. Uh, you know, getting, getting him to start moving in a way where he can start to loosen his grip on this same kind of national security state mentality. Uh, of, of thinking that there's a whole legitimate area in keeping secret from the people, you know, this extraordinary phenomenon of an extraterrestrial civilization. And even though he knows that they've not made any kind of hostile actions toward us, he does not view them turning off our nuclear weapons and then stepping back and allowing them to be turned back on. He doesn't view that as a hostile act. He views that as some kind of a warning to us. He sees it that way. Okay. Uh, and so that his evolution, uh, his, his personal evolution in, 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 in expanding his consciousness about this particular issue uh, and coming forward as a person who can act as a counterpoint to the, to the, the bullshit in the, the, the non-disclosure disclosures, you know, of like this last report, or even I'm sure the, the, the classified portions of this, you know, his continued insistence that the, the, it, it, he's not going to stand for them trying to pawn off uh, this, this phenomenon as being Chinese or Russian. 
He's just, he's just not going to do that. He's evolved to that stage where he's not going to continue flogging that threat, uh, that threat horse. You know, he, he's not going to do that. He has really come to appreciate, I think, in our conversations that this is a dangerous road to go down. You start selling that particular kind of a threat here, uh, and all it's going to do is generate a whole uh, a new round of weapons building, you know, out into space and building these platforms, et cetera. Uh, you know, so that so he understands that. Uh, and he's, he's evolving, uh, he, he's developing a really uh, more uh, sophisticated uh, perception of this whole thing. And as he starts to encounter more and more people from the media world who are really professional and really responsible and can get access to other sources and be able to, to demonstrate to him, you know, in a certain sense, like the New York Times does, that, you know, they aren't going to just throw everything up onto the front page that they get their hands on. You know, they're exercising some kind of a, a responsibility. A lot of us may, may think they overdo it and that they're too much of a part of that club and all that. That's, that's all true. I, I certainly have that opinion. But, but the bottom line is this dynamic that's going on right now is, is the, the most important moment that I think, I think any of us have seen you know, in all the years that we've been working on this particular subject. This particular period that began three years ago and is going to be going on for the next few years is the most important period that we've ever seen uh, in this phenomenon. We have to try to, we have to try to recruit every, like, like Melinda, you got a real, a real uh, oar in the water here with Jim Simivan. You know, and he's going to be one of the toughest cases in the whole world. When you get a covert operations guy from the operations director to the CIA, I mean, he's just bathed in that type of mentality. And if you can take advantage of, if it's true that there it may have been some personal experience that he's had, that is the major recruiting factor for all of us. You know, if, if he can start to evolve, if, if, uh, if Lou Elizondo can evolve, and we've got to get we've got to get some leverage into Hal Putoff. You know, Hal Putoff is going to be he's like 83, 84 years old or something now. You know, his wife, his wife is a, a devout Marianist. You know, is into Mary. You know, and 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 he and so there's there's different points of not leverage where we're trying to coerce anybody. There are certain positive features that all of these people have that we can help get in to communicate with them uh, and try to get them to come over to, to say, look, at the time has arrived. We've got to do this. We got to stop pretending that these people are a threat. We got to stop pretending that they're Chinese or Russian. We've got to make better friends with the people in China and the, and the Russian people. We've got to start perceiving ourselves as an earth species that has to develop a collective relationship with the extraterrestrial beings. This is, this is a, I mean, this is what our entire preparation has been for. Uh, all of the, all the reading we've done, all the, the stuff we've studied about religion and, and philosophy and in spiritual realms and in scientific realms and quantum physics and all the things that we've been spending all of our time trying to find out about, the time has come to bring all of these things to the table, you know, and to all talk with each other, to get past any kind of petty slights anybody's had with anybody else in the past and, and get all of us at the table uh, figuring out how to take advantage of this moment and recruit every single person we can not, not just the Jim Simi Vans and the Lou Elizondos and, and, the, and the Chris Mellons and the uh, Hal Putoffs, you know, but the people in the anti-nuke movement and the people in the environmental movement to get everybody on board this thing. This is the most extraordinary event in our entire human history, uh, you know, uh, and so that we, we've got to get them to appreciate that. I'm going to throw in that, you know, we need to activate all the women's movement groups as well. Oh, yes. Because we yes. know if when women get involved in things, the world actually changes. Yeah. So, yeah. On this note, you guys, I'm going to take up or I'm going to take this opportunity for us to wrap up. I just want to thank our earlier guests, Preston Dennett and Bob McGuire and Steve Bassett, who also had to leave. And I'm Nicole Sackage with Sinead and Grant Cameron. Thank you, Victor, Melinda, and Danny Sheehan. Thank you, guys. Thank you for having us. I apologize for being late. I'll be on time next time.
That's okay. There will be a next time. So there you go. <laughs> Danny said next time. So we're having another one. So thank you, guys. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Grant. Thanks yeah, I appreciate for it. Sure. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you for having us. Okay. Well, it was a great day. Hi, everybody. So I, I appreciate bye -bye. what everybody's doing. Everybody's bye -bye, doing a good guys. job. Far out. Let's get it. <laughs> good team. Go team. Go. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you.